Good morning, everybody. Can you hear me? Yes, excellent. Thank you, everybody. Um, we're going to start this morning with a poll. And if you could please answer that question for me, that'd be great. Good thing we're doing this about 12 months into the pandemic because everyone's really good with all these Zoom features. Wow, a lot of people for the first time. Look, we even have, I don't know if you can see the polling yet. I'll, I'll, I think I can share it. Don't know. Don't know. Okay. We've got 170 people signed in that can see the poll and almost everyone has answered it. I'm going to wait just another minute so those of us that have trouble finding our trigger finger can get the answers they want on there. Okay. Looks like everyone's answered who's going to answer. So now I'm going to see if I can share the results. So that's amazing. 21% for the first time. Well, welcome to the Genesee Valley Equine Clinic Winter Horse Health Seminar. And we really prefer to do this in person at the Wheatland Chilai High School. And uh, But this morning we can't do that, but we're really glad to be able to provide you something this year. And um, here we go. And we hope that we don't have too many technical difficulties. So just so you know, I'm here in the clinic with Christy Tacone, our office manager slash uh, licensed veterinary technician. And we're being helped by um, Ben, who's a student from RIT. So that if we have any technical difficulties, he can help us out because he's in his third year of game development at RIT. So he's got a lot more knowledge about this than we do. So we hope you'll all be patient with us. We're doing our very best and we're really excited to be able to be able to do something for you in the way of some uh, information for your horse care. Um, so during the during the webinars, we are happy to accept some questions, but only in the Q and A section. So not in the chat section. We're not monitoring the chat section. So the Q and A section is where you should put your questions that you'd like us to ask ask the panelists at the end of their talks. Those will be answered live on screen and we'll kind of filter through and combine questions if many of you are asking the same questions and we'll get as many as answered as we can. If this is the group that's usually showing up the auditorium, we know you will have plenty of questions. And that's great. If you, so we are not monitoring the raise your hand feature and the speakers will not be stopping during their uh, talks to answer questions. Let's see, we had some other things. At the top right of your screen, you can reduce the size of the panelists while the webinars are going on, while you're looking at their PowerPoints. So feel free to do that. Those are things you can play with. We can't do that for you. And I think it's time that I introduce our staff as we usually do at the front of the auditorium. So let me give that a try. Okay. <laughs> Sorry about that, everyone. We had we had practiced that a lot and that didn't work out so well. So I think most of you know me. I'm Dr. Amy Liebeck. I'm currently the owner of the practice and I've been here for a long time. And this is my first time doing a virtual webinar for all of you. Dr. Dwyer is with us uh, as a participant as well this morning. She's watching and she submitted us this to us this very nice picture of her on her horse when she was younger. And Dr. and Christy was able to Photoshop a helmet onto her so we could actually use the picture this year. Dr. Joan Ayers is out actually in the treatment area treating horses right now as we speak. And you know Dr. Amy Snyder and Dr. Sarah Pell, who's newer with us. She's joining us today as, as well. And Dr. Essis, who works for us every so often, a couple of days a month, helping us with some of our integrative medicine things. And this is Dr. Gabrielle Farragasso. You'll get to hear a lot more from her this morning about a technique we're using to treat wounds. Kelly, our technician who's been with us for quite a while, she welcomed a new baby during COVID-19. And Christy Tacone has been with us for quite a few years. This is definitely not her first seminar. And she has taken on a new role this year as partly a part of her job as office manager. Jamie Klemp is a newer technician to us, and she's actually out helping horses get better in the treatment area as well right now. Kathy Stein, who's been with us nearly forever, uh, near, for certainly for all of my forever, the whole time I've been here, but Kathy has transitioned to a part-time role and is doing more with the finances now, so you won't hear her voice nearly as much as you would have in the office. Whoops, how do I go backwards, guys? Oh, thank you. 
Sorry about that, Laura. Laura is um, still helping us out very well, and she has been working remotely all of this time. So those of you who called in and talked to Laura, all that she's getting done for you, she's doing from home and magically over the internet for us. And Julie has been in and out of the office during COVID-19. Currently, she's been working from home, and she'll be back soon. Katie Page, our inventory manager and veterinary assistant, has been uh, was is with us every every day here inside the clinic. And Catherine, also welcome to baby this year. So we've got a growing Genesee Valley Equine Clinic. She's coming back to work next week after maternity leave. Our uh, one of our receptionists. And then the next three folks are our people who work very part time on the weekends as we have needs for patient care, and they are certainly extremely valuable to the team. Jennifer Cornell, Kathy Stevenson and Jennifer Levy is newer to that team. And today helping us out, as I said before, is Ben Schlegel. Many thanks to Ben. Um, how do I go back to stop share? So everyone out there I know is very concerned about the door prizes <laughs> and we do have door prizes. I'll announce more of them after we finish up for the morning, but it is necessary that you are present in order to be eligible for a door prize and door prize won't be announced on the um, webinar today, but they will be, you will receive some email notification about whether or not you received one. All of our door prizes today come in the form of something that can be mailed. So a gift or certificate or some sort of a coupon. Okay. And if, does anyone have any questions about anything so far? If you do throw it into the Q and A, and I'm just gonna say one more thing. We love that you send in your photos of your horses and we have used as many as we could that came in prior to last week. If you sent some in over the weekend, then we're gonna use them next in next year's slideshow. And we did learn something that we cannot, the photos that come in through Facebook in the comments do not translate well into this format. So we'll be better about where to tell you to submit your photos next year, but we love it that you continue to send in your pictures and they bring us a lot of joy as we put the slideshow together. We love seeing your horses when they're healthy too, and sometimes we don't get to. Okay, anything coming up in the Q and A? All right, let me just see. Okay, we have one question is this being recorded and to the best of our knowledge it's being recorded we're doing our best and ben says we're recording it and we hope to save it in a format that people can enjoy at a later time all right so it is my great pleasure this morning to introduce dr jamie pribble she told us it's pribble like dribble so i'm going to share that with you as well dr pribble is a professional services veterinarian with boringer ingelheim after being in practice many years in a practice very similar to our practice, she was practicing in Minnesota in a group and she has now transitioned into industry and helping Boringer Ingelheim with their equine products. And the products that you're probably most familiar with from Boringer Ingelheim are Prescend, GastroGuard and Equiox, but they actually have contributed a lot more to the um, equine medicine arsenal. And she's gonna share some of that today uh, as well. She has many horses of her own. I asked her yesterday what her favorite, who her favorite horse is, and that is Jack. And he's a 13-year-old quarter horse gelding who's a barrel racer. And she likes him the best of all of her horses, but right now her daughter seems to have taken him over for her. Okay, so Dr. Pribble, thanks. Your screen is up. We've got it. Let's go. All right, uh, Amy, just to sound check, can you hear me okay? I can hear you well. Can somebody in the audience kind of raise your hand and say you can hear her well? There, yeah, sorry. Yeah, I didn't mean to raise your hand. Looks good. Thank you so much for that um, nice introduction. I'm sure there are other um, horse owners in the crowd that have uh, the same problem as I do, where um, we lose our best horse to our children. So I'm sure you can all relate. Um, I'm so excited to be here with you guys this morning. I really wish we could do this in person, but um, virtual has become you know, the norm. And so um, hopefully by next year, we can, we can get back to some semblance of normal and we can enjoy each other's company a little bit better. So today um, I'm gonna speak on every cough means something. And we're gonna discuss respiratory disease in the horse and um, kind of go through some information that should be very, very helpful to you. And like Amy said, um, I'd be happy to take questions at the end and hopefully we can get through them all. Um, in interest of 
um, bandwidth here because I don't have the best. I am going to try to turn my video off here. There, just so that um, if we have an unstable internet connection, we don't have issues. All right, to get started here, just um, like Dr. Liebeck said, I am employed by Beringer Ingelheim, and we do um, manufacture these products, which are all used for respiratory disease in the horse. I like to start with a few fun facts about our equine companions. Um, I always find something new and interesting to share with people. And I think you'll enjoy these. So at a full gallop, the horse actually takes in five gallons of air per second, which is pretty remarkable when you think about it. Horses can actually only breathe through their noses. So unlike ourselves, where we can actually breathe through our mouth and our nose, they can only breathe through their noses. So if they have an issue with, with a nasal passage, um, that would definitely limit their ability to uh, take in air. Horses actually hold their breath over jumps. And then this I think is really interesting and really tells a tale. Respiration is tied one-to-one -to, -one to the stride at the gallop. So if you think about it, anything um, that affects their ability to breathe is actually going to um, potentially shorten their stride. And this becomes particularly important um, in our horses, our, especially our race horses or any of our um, speed event horses or even our, you know, three-day eventers. And then if all the airways of the horse were laid out so that we could see the surface area, it would actually cover an area of 10 tennis courts and maybe even a little bit more. So this really tells the tale of, you know, why our horses are such great athletes because they have this huge capacity to uh, move air in and out of their bodies. Today we'll look at what can cause a cough and for the most part this is going to be um, equine respiratory disease and we'll discuss two overarching categories, infectious respiratory disease and non-infectious respiratory disease. I'll spend a little more time today discussing non-infectious respiratory disease, specifically asthma. This will be towards the end of the presentation. And the reason for this is, especially in our mild asthmatic horses, um, it can easily get overlooked. Infectious respiratory diseases are illnesses that can be transmitted from one horse to another. And of course, we're all familiar with an infectious respiratory disease that is affecting the human population right now with COVID-19. And some of these things are gonna be quite similar with our, um, with our equine respiratory infectious diseases in that um, these spread from horse to horse and mostly by respiratory droplets. So, um, it's a good idea when we're at you know, horse shows or in situations where our horse is around unfamiliar horses that we keep that social distancing that we're getting used to now as humans because these respiratory droplets can go quite a distance. So when your horse develops an infectious respiratory disease, this is something that you're going to notice as an owner pretty easily. We're gonna have some of these clinical signs. We may have all of them, some of them, um, and they're gonna vary in intensity depending on the disease and your individual horse and their immune status. Symptoms can include some or all of the following. So fever, and that fever can vary in intensity. So it could be mild or it could be pretty high. Usually the higher the fever, the more depressed or ill your horse is going to, uh, to appear. And one of the first clues that your horse may have a fever is a change in appetite. So um, they might go completely off feed or they might just become a little bit picky at eating their feed. Of course, there's other things that can cause your horse not to eat, but one of the first clues that something is going on with your horse that's not quite right is when they don't go to the feed bucket with great gusto and it just should prompt you to do some investigation. These horses can be depressed. Again, that symptom can vary from mild to severe. Uh, nasal discharge may be present, cough, and they may also have lymph node enlargement. So these are um, the most common respiratory diseases that are infectious that we see in the horse. Uh, equine influenza, equine herpes virus, which is also known as rhino or rhinopneumonitis. Um, strep equi is also known as strangles. So you're probably familiar with that. 
equine rhinitis virus, I won't spend a lot of time on today other than to say that this is a, a pretty common uh, respiratory virus that we see um, mostly in younger horses in stressful performance events such as racetracks. And then EHV2 and real virus, these are viruses that cause very, very mild symptoms. And um, they're kind of like the common cold um, that we experience in the horse world. So we don't have vaccinations to protect against EHV2 or real virus. Um, they don't cause much in the way of illness, you know, maybe a mild snotty nose, um, maybe a mild fever, and they can kind of run through the barn. And then parasites actually can cause some respiratory issues in our horses, so we'll cover that. Lower respiratory tract infections such as pneumonia are less common, thankfully. And I say that because pneumonia um, is a very serious disease in the horse. It can occur as a secondary uh, bacterial infection following viral respiratory disease and some other, there are some other causes. Um, and then and, um, we see it a little bit more commonly in foals. There's a bacteria called rhodococcus that can affect our, our foals and cause um, pneumonia in those guys. And we'll keep more to the adults today. So we won't spend any time talking about rhodococcus in foals, just so that you know that um, it can be a possibility if you have a baby that, um, is having some respiratory issues. Equine influenza is a highly contagious respiratory virus. It spreads rapidly through the horse population. Again, spreads by respiratory droplets. So those droplets can go horse to horse from just from a cough through the air, um, but can also be spread on equipment, feed tubs, water tubs, horse handlers, among other things. Um, horses rarely die from influenza, but they can become very, very sick and require um, expensive supportive care, sometimes even hospitalization for IV fluids just because they're so ill. And we can also see some potential complications with following the flu, um, such as pneumonia. And there's a very long recovery. So this tends to be an expensive disease if your horse um, um, contracts it because of the expensive supportive care, and then also that long recovery. So we end up with loss of use. And one of the reasons for the long recovery, I'm just gonna get my, I'm gonna get my highlighter, or my laser pointer here and point out a couple things. So we've got the, you know, typical snotty nose, this horse is on fluids, he's not feeling very good. And so needs some extra help while he's getting through um, his flu virus. And then if we look down here, this is actually um, an electron uh, microscope picture of what the respiratory tract lining looks like. And it's covered in what we call cilia, which are these little tiny finger-like projections. And what these cilia do is they produce mucus and then they help to uh, trap pathogens such as viruses, bacteria, particulate matter that the horse breathes in. And they work in a fashion where they, they kind of beat repetitively repetitively, kind of like waves washing up on a shore. And they help to move that mucus that traps all those pathogens up the trachea and into the back of the throat where they can be swallowed. What happens with flu, which is very remarkable, is that it destroys this respiratory epithelium or the lining of the respiratory tract. So then we get this kind of situation where we just have a few of these cilia, but really everything has been denuded. And you can see that really um, causes an issue with, with protection. This is why we sometimes see secondary bacterial pneumonia because they can't do a good job of moving some of those pathogens out. And then we have to think about when we're talking about recovery for these guys, it takes a long time to regenerate this. So it's gonna take um, several months. And one of the things um, that we usually recommend following flu is that they take um, at least two weeks off of rest after the coughing stops. And the coughing doesn't stop right away when they're no longer infectious, right? If you think about having a cold yourself, you feel a lot better pretty quickly, you get over the cold, but that cough will linger on for quite a period of time. And so these horses can be out, you know, for a month or two, um, sometimes before we can get them back into work. So prevention is possible. Um, we really need to think about practicing biosecurity and that's gonna be an overarching theme when we talk about infectious disease in the horse. 
And that's, you know, not sharing buckets, um, keeping horses isolated that uh, come to the farm for the first time. So quarantining for them for a period of time. Um, when you're at horse shows or trail rides, don't use community water tubs, things like this. And treat uh, sick horses on the farm, handle them last after you've handled all the, all the um, healthy horses. And then um, the nice thing is we do have a good vaccine for influenza um, for the horse. And not all vaccines are created equal. So it's important when you're looking at your flu vaccination um, to make sure that it has the most up-to-date strains um, for North America um, so that your horse gets the best coverage. And the protocol that we use to vaccinate your horse is really gonna depend on their risk and their situation. So a good discussion to have with your veterinarian. Moving on to equine herpes virus, this is what you will know as rhino or rhinopneumonitis. Um, there's two forms that are included in this, um, in this disease, EHV1 and EHV4. EHV4 is an upper respiratory disease, so snotty nose, coughing. Um, EHV1 can produce respiratory disease, late-term abortion in pregnant mares, and also neurologic disease. So when you hear about those neurologic herpes breakouts um, across the country, um, occasionally throughout the year, this is what's going on is they have those horses have EHV1. Um, horses that contract EHV1 um, do not always develop neurologic disease. Um, they can have just the respiratory disease. So that's important to know. Uh, again, spreading through those respiratory droplets, also aborted fetus and membranes and fluids. And the symptoms will vary in severity depending on the horse, um, the viral load that they get and their vaccination status. And the tricky thing about equine herpes virus is that it goes latent. So once after their initial infection, the virus actually becomes dormant in the horse, but it stays there. And stressful events, such as you're going to a horse show, trailering, um, these can uh, induce shedding of that virus. And that's why we can see this sometimes pop up seemingly out of nowhere, um, commonly pops up you know, following a horse show and a number of horses. And that's because those horses were um, stressed, even though maybe they don't look stressed, um, their body is stressed and they started to shed this virus. So prevention is going to be, again, practicing good biosecurity measures and to vaccinate. Um, vaccination decreases the severity of respiratory disease and reduces nasal shedding in inf infected horses. And it can actually prevent abortion. We don't actually have any vaccine that has good protection against the neurologic form. So something that we hope we'll have in the future. Um, and then your vaccination protocol, again, is going to depend on your horse's risk. The dreaded strangles. I'm sure that you have all heard of strangles or seen a case or been involved in a situation where this has run through a barn. Um, it's an ugly disease. It's a bacteria, strep streptococcus bacteria, and it rap it's highly contagious. It spreads rapidly through populations, um, spreads via those nasal droplets, discharge from abscesses, and horse to horse on equipment, handlers, water buckets. Um, it, the, the bacteria is actually pretty hardy in the environment, um, depending on the environmental conditions. So it can last in the environment for several weeks. It's often quite costly to treat um, due to the lancing of these abscesses and treating wounds. Um, and then these quarantines at stables can, can run for months. So we can have that again, that loss of the ability to use our horse because they were sick. And then after they're done being sick, you know, there's still other sick horses on the property. And so we can't have any horses going in and out. Um, the, the symptoms of this disease are gonna vary again um, in severity, depending on the horse, depending on their vaccination status. Oftentimes these young guys, our babies, are the ones that, um, that get hit you know, harder. Um, they tend to get these abscesses in the throat latch area, one of the reasons um, strangles got its name. And then oftentimes we're going to see abscesses of the lymph nodes on, commonly under the jaw, though um, any lymph node in the body can abscess and we can actually get um, internal abscesses as well. And, and then, uh, you know, snotty nose. Prevention, again, biosecurity measures 
and then um, we do have a vaccination for this. So vaccination can aid in the reduction of disease, but some vaccinated horses will still contract strangles when exposed. So that's important to know and to keep your expectations um, um, not low, but definitely keep your, uh, understand that this doesn't always prevent your horse from developing strangles. It just may reduce the, the severity of the disease. Vaccinated horses usually are less sick if they do contract strangles. So that is nice. And vaccination for this disease um, can be a little bit tricky. So it involves a good discussion with your veterinarian and will include assessment again of their risk and history of if they've been exposed to strangles in the past or if they've previously had an infection and how long ago, because that will help determine whether or not uh, we should vaccinate your horse currently for strangles. Parasites can actually cause some respiratory symptoms in horses, particularly roundworms. So if we look at our, our diagram here, um, a roundworm, part of their life cycle they, um, the larvae actually travel through the liver and then through the lungs where they're coughed up and swallowed and then they go on to mature in the intestine of the horse. So it's this migratory phase through the lungs that can cause coughing and nasal discharge. Older horses typically develop their own kind of immunity to roundworms. Um, so usually not a cause of cough in horses over two years of age. And I would say I see this myself mostly in, um, in weanlings that haven't been on a good deworming program. And they can have that unthrifty kind of wormy looking appearance as well, where they have kind of the pot belly appearance too, but not always. And then we have the lungworm. So donkeys, these cute little guys are the prime source of pasture contamination for horses. Uh, this, this lungworm affects donkeys, but they don't show very many signs. So it can be kind of, uh, you can be unaware that they are having an issue. And then um, they're the ones that are going to pass it on to our horses. And the adult worms uh, live in the lungs. They lay eggs in the lungs and those are coughed up and swallowed to hatch in the feces. And so horses that are affected by this can be any age and they will um, often have cough. They can have increased respiratory rate and an unthrifty appearance. Treatment and preventing parasites, and this really goes for, for any of the parasites um, that our horses deal with, is, is an individualized deworming program that's based on fecal egg counts. So looking at, at the egg count in your horse's fecal is going to help your veterinarian put together uh, a program that's tailored specifically for that horse and help us to um, avoid creating uh, worms that are resistant to the dewormers that we have. And then environmental management is really important. So manure management is key, um, trying to get that manure off the pasture, rotating pastures and then dragging the pasture uh, will help to, um, to decrease that parasite population. When we diagnose infectious respiratory disease, the viruses and, and strangles that we've talked about earlier, um, oftentimes we'll do a nasal or nasal pharyngeal swab and um, a, what's called a PCR test. And the PCR test is a, a test, it's a very rapid test and it looks for DNA of the pathogen. The nice thing um, is that many of our labs uh, that we send uh, these, these tests to have actual respiratory panels because a lot of these respiratory diseases can look similar. So a panel is really nice because they look for all of the major uh, respiratory uh, viruses and also strangles at the same time. So you can submit one or two swabs and get, um, get a lot of information. We can also do bacterial or viral culture paired serum testing. Um, and which of these tests you use will depend on, you know, what the veterinarian thinks is the most appropriate at that time. And then a CBC and chemistry panel, um, this is a general health panel to look at the overall health of your horse. It's not actually going to look for specific diseases, but rather look at their white cell counts, liver, kidney function, uh, electrolytes and fluid balance. And this is important to do um, when we have a sick horse to look at the overall well-being of the horse and 
um, help us direct supportive care. So, you know, is the horse very dehydrated? Um, do we need to get this horse on fluids? So oftentimes we're going to want to pull that, that panel as well, just to get an overall idea of, of how the horse is doing to direct our supportive care. Key points for our respiratory diseases that are infectious. So prevention is possible. Um, biosecurity is very, very important. So we want to, you know, quarantine new horses when they come from the farm, come to the farm or isolate them. Um, when you're going to be, um, you know, moving buckets from one horse to another, make sure that we're disinfecting them. Uh, when you're at horse shows or trail riding events, don't share common water sources. And uh, one thing I, I find people overlook is when you're at these events um, with lots of commingling of horses is when you're filling buckets, make sure you do it like this because a lot of people will drop this hose into the bucket and let the water fill up over it. And so then this hose covered with all sorts of germs gets put from one bucket to the next to the next and um, is just a really good source for spreading uh, disease from horse to horse. And then we wanna vaccinate our at-risk horses. So determining whether your horse is at risk is going to be that good conversation you have with your veterinarian. And then develop a deworming program based on those fecal egg counts and follow your veterinarian's recommendations for an individualized deworming program. Make sure that you have a thermometer um, that you can use for your horse. If you don't know how to use a thermometer or take your horse's temperature, your vet will be happy to help you do that and learn to do it. Um, practice safely with your horse. Um, usually the first time they're a little bit nervous about it, but take your time and um, make sure you practice it regularly so they're kind of used to it because one of the first questions your vet will ask you when you call and say that your horse is maybe off feed or not doing right is, um, do they have a fever? And a normal temperature in a horse should be somewhere around uh, 100 degrees or maybe a little bit less. And then finally, develop this strong relationship with your veterinarians at Genesee Valley so that you can work together to determine what the right vaccination protocol is for your horse, the right deworming program. You wanna discuss your horse's environment, their job, their risks, nutrition, all of these things are, are very important. Make sure to ask a lot of questions and, and make a list ahead of time so that you have those questions available and don't, then it'll avoid um, situations where you forget and wish that you asked that question. Um, have questions ready and be sure to ask them. We love questions. We'll switch gears now and talk about non-infectious causes of cough. So we can have anatomical abnormalities that can lead to cough, or more often in that situation, we'll have some sort of noisy respiration. We can have esophageal obstruction or choke, and we need to, hear, we need to include this here because it may need veterinary intervention. So we'll describe how to recognize this problem. Exercise-induced pulmonary pulmonary hemorrhage or EIPH. This is where we see bleeding from the lungs. And then finally, we'll finish up talking about non-infectious lower airway disease or asthma. These anatomical abnormalities that we can see often occur in the pharynx, which is the back of the throat. And so that's this area here. Um, again, sometimes there's a cough, but more often than not, there'll be respiratory noise. Sometimes the noise can only be heard when the horse is actually working. And sometimes there isn't any noise and the only clue that there is an issue is poor performance, um, particularly at speed events or endurance type events. And we're gonna diagnose this by a thorough examination and um, usually some imaging. So sometimes we'll take radiographs, but most often we're going to use an endoscope um, to look at the back of your horse's throat and, and down the trachea. So this is what the back of your horse's throat looks like or the pharynx, and this is a normal horse. And what we have here is this nice opening, that's our trachea, that's heading down to our lungs. This horse is breathing in right now, and these are called a retinoid cartilages, and these are lifted out of the way when the horse is breathing in so that we can have maximal opening of the airway. 
this triangle shaped structure is the epiglottis. And this flips up and covers up the airway when your horse is eating so that we don't get food down here. When we look at the abnormalities that we can have, we can have what's called laryngeal paresis or paralysis of varying degrees. And so that's what's going on here in this picture on the left. And if you compare it to our normal horse, you can see that these cartilages are kind of flopped down and we don't have a nice open airway. And be, the reason for that is that this horse has some paralysis of this um, retinoid cartilage. And so one of the reasons we hear noise is because this just kind of sits here and kind of flaps in the breeze when the horse is taking air in and out. And so that's where you get that noise. These horses are often called roarers. We can have dorsal displacement of the soft palate and that's what's happening in this picture. And you can see that our epiglottis is missing and that's because this soft palate has flipped up over it. And this can be a cause of poor performance. And then we can have epiglottic entrapment so again, you can see the epiglottis here, but it looks different. And the reason it looks different is it's got this smooth outline and that's because there's a membrane that the epiglottis is entrapped in. We can also have pharyngeal collapse. So the area in the back of the throat here can just sort of collapse in on itself. And again, these horses can't move the air through very well. So most of these are going to be um, issues that require surgery to correct. They're not life-saving surgeries, but they are performance-saving surgeries. And surgery might not be necessary if, you know, if we're looking at a horse that has a life of leisure or is retired, or perhaps we have, you know, low performance demands such as, you know, just light trail riding and that's all that's expected. There are a few cases where conservative medical treatment can be helpful. And this can be sometimes in growing horses, or if you actually have some sort of you know, infection where um, you get some sort of swelling or abscess or something in one of these structures, uh, sometimes all we need to do is treat with medications and then the swelling goes down and, and the noise goes away. So choke, um, this is a situation where feed obstructs the esophagus. So your horse is eating, and they swallow and the feed gets stuck in the esophagus, the tube between the back of the throat and the stomach, and it doesn't work its way down. Causes are eating their feed really, really fast or what's called bolting their feed. Uh, poor dentition can be an issue, especially in our old horses where their teeth may be worn very, very smooth or they are missing many teeth so they can't chew their food appropriately. And we can also have abnormalities within the esophagus itself um, such as a narrowing or scarring from a previous choke. There can be a pocket or even a mass. And masses sometimes can be inside the esophagus or outside and they push on the esophagus and make it narrow. You can also have an injury to the neck around the esophagus that can cause narrowing. So these are all things we need to consider. Clinical signs are gonna include a cough and feed coming out the nose. And so you can see this horse here has this green discharge from the nose. Oftentimes they'll be drooling as well. The color may vary depending on what your horse is choking on. So if they're choking on you know, a pelleted feed, grass or hay, um, this color can vary. These horses tend to stretch and arch their neck, cough. Um, they're very, very anxious. And this can actually sometimes present um, as colic. So this is kind of a nice depiction of what these horses often will look at like. They'll stretch their neck out like this. They'll be drooling. They have a very anxious look. Um, I have seen horses actually, you know, throw themselves to the ground. Um, they're just very anxious. And I think, you know, one of the things going on in their mind is something's wrong and I don't know what to do about it. So what am I going to do? So they'll act uh, quite strange. Um, but your clue is that that feed is coming out the nose. So first thing you wanna do if you suspect your horse is choking is to immediately remove the feed and water because we don't wanna to add to the choke. Call your veterinarian right away. Um, many chokes actually resolve spontaneously on their own within about 30 minutes or so, but you still wanna make that phone call and discuss the issue with your veterinarian. If the choke doesn't resolve on its own, 
uh, we will have to treat it. And this involves sedating the horse and then passing a nasogastric tube up the nose and down the esophagus and trying to gently push that bolus of food down to the stomach. A lot of times um, we actually have to do what's called lavage. So we'll pass that tube, we'll get up against the feed, the feed won't move. And so we'll have to pump water in and try to break up that feed um, so that it breaks up and then we can get it to go down to the stomach. And this is all done quite gently uh, because we don't want to damage the esophagus. And then oftentimes we're going to follow up with antibiotics because um, there is a, a possibility that the horse has aspirated food when it's choking. So it can get um, feed material into the trachea and down into the lungs. So secondary pneumonia can be, can be a concern. Following up to a choke, typically a special diet of a sloppy mash for several days because you have the most risk of rechoking within those first three to four days because of the swelling and irritation in the, in the esophagus and that can make it na more narrow than usual. Uh, oftentimes we'll scope these horses to look for abnormalities in the esophagus. And also we can do radiographs. Um, sometimes they're needed if we don't see something on the scope, but we expect that there's something there. We'll put a, a contrast dye down into the esophagus, take an x-ray and the dye will outline the esophagus for us. And, and then you can kind of pick up if there is some sort of you know, pocket or something, or it might outline a mass and give us an idea of what's going on or a very narrow area. And then for sure, a good dental exam to make sure that their teeth, um, their teeth are uh, healthy, um, if they're old, um, determine if they're worn smooth or if they're missing a lot of teeth, we may need to uh, change their diet um, to avoid long stem forage. They may have to live on a pelleted feed or a sloppy mash um, if their teeth are in really, really bad shape. And then if for prevention, you know, if your horse is a really fast eater and that's the issue, we want to eliminate the competition. So if we have buddies that he's worried about, um, bring that one horse inside or figure out a way to feed them separately so they don't have to worry about eating their feed so fast. And one other trick is to add some large rocks to the feeder so they have to move that, that rock around to, and it slows them down. So exercise induced pulmonary hemorrhage, this is bleeding into the lungs, typically is going to occur at strenuous high speed events like barrel racing or uh, in racehorses. The bleeding occurs due to uh, its multifactorial causes. So high blood pressure, lung inflammation, and this increased negative pressure uh, that occurs in the lungs when horses exercise at high speeds and high intensity. Clinical signs will be a cough during or after strenuous exercise. Uh, more often, a poor performance will be um, something that we notice. So we see these horses that, you know, go out of the gates or start a barrel pattern really, really well, and then they kind of just shut down. And we can see blood from the nose, but it's not actually that common to see the blood come out the nose. So only about 5% of cases, we think um, we actually get blood at the nose. So diagnosing this um, involves endoscopy. Uh, we we want to do this 30 to 90 minutes after exercise to look for blood. If you can't scope the horse after exercise, we can perform a test um, called a bronchoalveolar lavage that looks at the cells from the airway for evidence of previous bleeding. There are also other reasons a horse can bleed from the nose. So if you notice blood in one or both nostrils at any time, you should consult your vet. And then treatment and prevention are or uh, involve assessing, you know, for underlying disease, you know, cardiac disease, um, things like asthma that could um, cause a irritation in the lung and lead to this, um, and then ensure appropriate fitness. Is the horse fit enough to be doing that strenuous exercise? If we have a bleed, we want to rest these horses for a period of time, and then some of these horses actually do need to be medicated to help prevent bleeding. Finally, we'll take a look at equine asthma. So asthma-like syndrome symptoms have been recognized for thousands of years. In fact, Aristotle um, usually actually mentions an asthma-like condition in horses back in a text from 300 BC. It's a disease known by many names. Most of you probably have heard these before. Broken wind, heaves, pulmonary emphysema, COPD, 
recurrent our airway obstruction and inflammatory disease. And over the past um, five, six years, we've had a, a group of equine asthma experts that got together and redefined this condition in the horse and it's now collectively known as equine asthma syndrome. We have two categories within equine asthma syndrome. We have mild to moderate asthma and severe asthma. Our mild to moderate cases are typically going to be our younger horses to middle-aged horses with an occasional cough, uh, but that's chronic. And poor performance is really the, the hallmark of uh, mild to moderate equine asthma. The nice thing about mild to moderate cases is that these can improve. Uh, we have the opportunity to reverse these cases and the recurrence is low. With our severe asthma, these are our heavy horses. They typically are older, uh, usually older than seven. With a frequent cough, they too have exercise intolerance and oftentimes have a increased respiratory effort at rest. But we can have a spectrum of mild to moderate to severe within the severe category as well. So keep that in mind, these signs will fluctuate um, with these horses, but they're recurrent and progressive. So we can't cure severe equine asthma, but we can control the clinical science. Asthma is actually quite prevalent in the population. Uh, about 14 to 17 percent of horses in our northern cool climate, 11 um, percent of hospital admissions uh, are attributed to severe equine asthma. And that number is a little bit misleading because most, most cases of severe equine asthma don't make it to a university type hospital, um, which is where this study came from. So a lot of them are gonna be treated um, by your local veterinarian on the farm. So um, it's quite prevalent. And we can see that there is actually a genetic um, predisposition for it. So if we have a sire or a dam that was affected with asthma, there's a 27 to 65% chance um, that the offspring will be affected as well. And then mild to moderate asthma is pretty prevalent as well. So about 10 to 20% of our sport performance horses and 80% of race horses are affected. Clinical signs, they really will vary depending on whether the horse has mild, moderate or severe asthma, the intensity will vary. And um, again, even with severe asthma, the intensity of those clinical signs will vary across the spectrum. So we can see poor performance, increased respiratory rate and effort, prolonged recovery from performance, that chronic cough. In our very severe cases and chronic cases, they'll develop a heave line like this horse here where you see this line along the abdomen, that's the muscles have um, have hypertrophied or increased the muscle mass here from that horse trying to push air out of its lungs. And then we can sometimes see nasal discharge and even weight loss in our really chronic horses. Again, this guy here, and that's just from the, the, you know, the caloric needs of this horse just to breathe are incredible. Equine asthma is caused by an airway hyper-responsiveness. So we get inflammation, um, of the airways, we get bronchospasm, and this is where the smooth muscle that surrounds the airway kind of squeezes down and closes down the airway. We get increased mucus production, and all of this leads to airway obstruction. So in this endoscopic view here, we're looking down the trach, and you can see all this mucus here. Now it's normal to have mucus because the mucus does what we talked about earlier, where it captures pathogens and particulate matter and helps to move it up and out of the horse. But when we have an inflamed airway, it overproduces mucus. And then that, um, that system of being able to move that mucus up really easily kind of fails because we have this really thick mucus laying in here. And then this is just the difference looking at, you know, a normal airway here with a nice open airway. And now we have um, our asthma affected airway with a very narrow airway mucus and all of this inflammation and swelling of the airway lining and then the smooth muscle squeezing down further narrowing that airway. So asthma is caused um, by uh, multifactorial issues. Uh, we can see potential of previous disease. So bacteria or viruses leading to uh, asthma down the road. 
Uh, we have individual horse characteristics such as genetics, age, and their individual immune response. And then the big thing is the environment because our horses live in really um, pretty dusty environments. And this is something that we as owners and veterinarians and barn managers can do the most about. When we look at the environment, it's these respirable particles that are less than five microns. Um, there's dust in our feed stalls and arenas and molds and plant fragments and all of these, if they're less than five microns, they can make it into the lower airway and lead to the airway inflammation. So we diagnose this again, based on a thorough physical exam, looking at all the things we've talked about before and then a very good listen to the chest of the horse. And finally, one of the most common things we do is called a rebreathing examination. And this is where we have your horse breathe into a garbage bag and listen to their lung sounds. And this is so we can get the horse to really breathe deeply. And we can listen for wheezes and crackles and squeaks within the lungs and how the air is moving through all the lung fields. We also assess tolerance. So how do they handle it? Cough and recovery. Now a horse with severe asthma, um, they're not going to tolerate this very well. It's only going to take a, a second to be able to, a few minutes to be able to hear their good lung, their lung sounds well. But in a horse with, with mild asthma, we may have to have them breathe into that bag for several minutes in order to get um, a really good listen to all those areas in the lungs. We can also use our endoscope to look down there and look at um, the amount of mucus in the in the trachea. So we have a scoring system of zero to five and anything over two actually affects performance in our horses. We can also check for those upper airway abnormalities we talked about earlier. And then we can move further down the trachea and this is just looking at where we um, divide off into the left and right lung. This is a normal horse. This is a horse affected by flu. And so if you remember back to losing all that cilia there, this is what that looks like um, on, a, on a gross picture. And you can see just how irritated and inflamed it is. And then this is a horse with severe equine asthma, very swollen, thickened, and very narrow uh, airways. Gold standard for testing for asthma in humans is pulmonary function testing, where you breathe into a tube forcefully and they measure your lung function. Unfortunately, in the horse, this isn't clinically available at this time. Um, it would be really nice to have a stall side test because then we could effectively look at um, how well the horse is improving on treatment um, and what is actually going on. But we don't have this at this time. What we do have and what is the gold standard is the Bronco alveolar lavage. And this is a done understanding sedation with a BAL tube, which is what this is or with a endoscope and we put some fluid into the horse's lungs, a small amount, pull it back and then look at the cell numbers to determine what they are and how many they are. And it gives us a good idea of what's going on. When we're treating asthma, we're going to first attack the environment. That's gonna be our number one step. And then secondary, we're going to control the inflammation with a corticosteroid. And thirdly, we may use a bronchodilator. Our goals of treatment, again, are going to be to decrease that environmental exposure because our drugs are only transitory. And we have to keep in mind that changing that environment takes a long time to make a difference for our horse. So not to get frustrated um, when you don't see a big change right away. It can take three to six months actually to see maximal improvement um, in airway function after environmental change. And then our medical therapy is going to include attacking this inflammation with our corticosteroids. For environmental management, we want to change their housing, get these guys outside, remove dust, um, dampen our shavings down. We can use cardboard or paper in the stalls or even a just keep the horse on rubber mats, um, wet the aisles down when we're sweeping, try to avoid storing hay above the stalls and get the horses outside when we're cleaning or sweeping the barn. And then to pay attention to your arena footing as well and keep that dust down. When we look at feeding, um, some of these horses actually end up having to go on a complete pelleted feed. 
um, just because they can't handle the dust from hay. We can soak our hay before feeding and recognize that we need to soak it for a period of time. So just dunking it or spraying it isn't actually enough. Uh, we need to go for more than 10 minutes. Um, we can use hay steamers, we can feed hay lidge. Feeding the hay on the floor is better um, than actually in a net because it decreases the dust. If you do have to use a net for other reasons, like your horse is prone to ulcers or um, they're an easy keeper or something like that and they need a slow feed net, you can still use that net, but wet that hay down well. And if you can keep it down lower to the floor, that's better because it helps that mucociliary system help to move uh, things up and out of the, the airways with gravity and avoid the round bale. So these are some of the medications that we can use. We can use uh, corticosteroids systemically, or we can use them inhaled. A lot of times we use these systemically. They're easy to use and they're quite cost effective. But we can see potential for some increased adverse effects. So we can see cortisol suppression, um, occasionally laminitis when we treat horses with these, and sometimes even immunosuppression. With our inhaled administration, at least what we've had in the past, um, we've been using human inhalers um, and an administration device. And we hope that we're getting maximal drug concentration at the site and minimizing the systemic risk when we use these. But they're quite expensive. And again, we need a device. For our bronchodilators, we have clenbuterol or albuterol. Clenbuterol can be given systemically. Um, this is easy to do. It comes in an oral syrup and it may also help with that mucociliary clearance and it may help to decrease our steroid use. The albuterol that we use is in an, a human inhaler um, and we can use this for a rescue situation. Um, we are, again are hoping to get that maximal drug concentration to the lower airway. And it requires that administration device. And albuterol is actually not orally available to the horse, so we really have to give it the inhalation. These are some of the systems that have been available in the past to give inhalers to horses. We can also nebulize our horses. Um, one of the drawbacks of nebulization is we only get about 10 to 20% delivered to the lower airways. So I'm just gonna quick, in the interest of time, we're getting a little bit long here. So I'm gonna quick just run through this. I might skip a few slides, but um, we have something new for our asthmatic horses. So I just wanted to show you that. This is called the Acervo Equihaler. And it's the only product, um, inhaled product that's FDA approved for the horse. And it's been um, scientifically validated for our horses breathing patterns and in asthmatic horses. And it's a two component, um, product that comes with a corticosteroid called seclesinide, and then this soft mist inhaler that was designed specifically for the horse. So we're going to skip through this because I just don't want to keep you guys too long and I don't want to put anybody else on the spot to be late. But I want to show you some key components about this inhaler. So Here's our key points. So the seclesinide, which is the corticosteroid, and it's a new steroid that we're using in horses, is a prodrug. And what that means is it's not active till it reaches its target tissue, which is the respiratory epithelium. So once it gets down into the lower airways, it becomes the activated form of the medication. It's a very potent corticosteroid. And because it's only activated in that area, it doesn't really go systemic, which increases the safety profile of this medication. And then we have this soft mist technology, which comes from the human side, uh, but the soft mist is, uh, allows us to have this really high fine particle fraction of those less than five microns that we talked about with um, particulate matter. Those are the particles that get to our lower airways in the horse. And um, we need that size to get down to the lower airways. So this inhaler provides that size. And then we have a low velocity mist. So unlike human inhalers that kind of shoot out really quickly, this mist comes out over a, a longer period of time, allowing the horse to breathe it in more effectively. And then we get dose, an accurate dose every time we use this. 
It's been proven eff efficacious in our asthmatic horses. So over 88% of horses showed improvement in the clinical signs. And it's well accepted as you can see here and very safe. Now just jump ahead again for you guys and just hit the key points from our presentation. So cough in indicates irritation. We have infectious versus in non-infectious. So make sure you're checking for fever, vaccinating and deworming as appropriate. Practice good biosecurity. Remember poor performance might be your only clue in some of these issues. And remember asthma is common, even um, mild asthma. So if you have any cough, you should be discussing that with your, your veterinarian, even if your horse just coughs a few times at the beginning of exercise or at the beginning of eating, uh, make sure you mention that to your veterinarian. And then finally, have a good close relationship with your vet. Uh, this is so important for determining what the best course of action, what your plan for your horse is, and um, what vaccines you should use, and what their environment looks like, nutrition, what their job is, and prepare ahead of time by writing down those list of concerns and questions. And don't be afraid to reach out to your veterinarian with questions because we love questions and we'd like to hear from you and we'd rather have you ask a question sooner than later. So with that, I'll take any questions you may have. Okay, I'm back. <laughs> and uh, Dr. Pribble, if you want to stop screen sharing and then we'll have our faces on the screen, that'd be great. Sure. Okay, I'm going to start with this one because the rest are written down. I'm just going to pull my screen back down. Um, the question was, do you know of any supplements that might be good for horses with um, equine asthma that would support the lung function? I mean, I can think of one, but I have to say we haven't yep, used yep. it very much. So I'm curious what you have to say. Yeah, so there's not a lot of science, as you know, Amy. I mean, we, you know, unfortunately, not a lot of science behind supplements. And so it's hard to make a recommendation unless it's based on science. So science, when I say science, um, meaning good clinical studies where we look at numbers of horses and how they do on these supplements and do they improve, do they not improve? Um, and a good study should be clinically, you know, should be blinded and things like that. A lot of times when we look at supplements um, and how they're advertised, it's mostly testimonials, right? You know, my horse did great on this and you should try it too. Um, I know that there's been some work done on the, um, on the omega fatty acids. And there is one supplement out there that has had a small study. Um, I believe there was either six to eight horses in that study. And that's um, probably the product you're thinking of, the Arenas product, um, yes. Alera. And um, I have put some horses on that. Um, I don't know if it helped them because most of the time we're treating the asthma with medications as well, but it certainly, you know, it certainly does no harm. Um, and so, and I've, I've actually tried it on, on one of my, my horses here. Unfortunately, they didn't, mine didn't find it super palatable. So I think it just depends but really need to do your research on the company when you're looking at these supplements. Okay, great. And um, agreed, it's always hard to know with the supplements about those things. There was another question about use of Benadryl. Um, what do you think about use of Benadryl in these horses with what we would probably call lower airway disease? Different family of drugs, so, obviously. Uh, yeah, so unfortunately, um, Benadryl and other antihistamines haven't shown very good um, efficacy in our horses with asthma. Now, certainly, um, if you have a horse with like allergic rhinitis, where they actually have more of an upper thing going on with an itchy nose and the drippy eyes, there are a few horses out there like that. And I think um, antihistamines can help those horses, but really not very effective for our asthmatic horses. I agree. I think I see it more used for it for hives or that upper airway type of a thing. This is a good right. question. Is the soft mist, I'm assuming they're talking about the acervo inhaler, 
would that make a good emergency inhaler? And honestly, I'd say this is a this is a question we have here as veterinarians with the the new inhaler with the cyclosamide. Sure. So I mean, yeah. you open it and you have to use it within a number of days. And so it would be Correct. lovely to think this could be used when the horse is having a really a ten out of ten heavy day is what we would call that. So um, yeah, it should be looked at as an emergency rescue inhaler. So short answer is no. Um, <laughs> you, anything that we're gonna use for emergency is going to be our bronchodilators, right? Because those work right away. So if you think of a human asthma attack, what are they reaching for? They're reaching for albuterol. So our bronchodilators, which we have several that, you know, we have some that are injectable and we have some that are oral and we can use a, a human albuterol inhaler to help give that horse relief. But when we're looking at um, the soft mist inhaler or any of our other corticosteroids, those are more for uh, long-term treatment of that inflammation. And it's going to take a little bit of time for that inflammation to settle down. So I would still use it, definitely use it in those horses. Um, but like any corticosteroid, it's going to probably take a day or two. It really depends on how bad, you know, the, the horse is. And sometimes, you know, a horse can be having a severely heavy episode, but their lungs aren't severely damaged yet. And we have no way to tell that, right? Because we can't do lung function testing, um, but we can still try. We're still going to treat those horses with a corticosteroid. It's just going to depend on the individual horse, how quickly and then how much they respond to it. So you should see a, an effect with that inhaler within, you know, one to two days. Okay, great. Let's move away from that a minute. And I think there's a little bit of curiosity about the donkey and mule worms. And so sure. should, yeah. horse, should horses who are being pastured with donkeys and mules be tested and treated for lung worms? So just like, you know, you're going to want to do fecal egg counts just like you normally would. And again, a good discussion to have with yourself and your um, other veterinarians in the practice is, you know, how many fecal egg counts should we do a year? And usually, you know, you're starting with one in the spring and seeing where these horses are at. And then, of course, doing the same thing with the donkeys, too. We don't want to forget about those guys. And then designing that deworming program based around those fecal egg counts. I guess it also begs the question, uh, we have plenty of donkeys who are purchased as uh, pasture mates for horses. Sure. Yeah. And there's, that's complicated too, right? Because donkeys don't need any food and horses need lots yes. of food. But, right. And we, I have to say in, in my time here, I haven't had to treat a horse who I was suspicious of having an infection from lungworms from donkeys. How, how about in your practice when you were, when you were in uh, routine practice, did you think you saw it or would you caution people no. against pasturing together? I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't. I think it's something to be aware of. And I think if we're, you know, if we're conscious about, you know, doing a good, you know, individualized deworming program on our horses, it's not something that you should, you know, be overly concerned about. We just need to make sure that we're aware that can be an issue and that, you know, we're looking for it by doing a good fecal egg count. Okay, so maybe for those animals pastured with donkeys, look at them more routinely when we initially start looking at them and then develop their fecal egg count program based on our findings. Exactly, okay. yeah. This is a good one. So after a horse has influenza, do all of the cilia regenerate? They, they actually do. They actually do so, but it takes a really, really long time. Um, and um, I don't have the number in my head right now, but I wanna say it's at least a month of, of regeneration time from once those are wiped out to being able to regenerate them. So um, there is some concern that there could be some, you know, and they haven't, they've linked it um, in, in the human literature, they've linked influenza to asthma in humans. Um, so a previous episode of influenza in humans can be linked to the development of asthma um, later on. The question of that happening in horses is still out. So they're still trying to do some research and we might get some good information out of um, Australia because they don't have severe asthma in Australia um, and they don't have flu, but they did have a terrible flu outbreak in 2010. Yeah. And so there's a bunch of researchers there that are going to try to are looking at 
at those horses to see if any of them are developing asthma down the road. So I think that'll be interesting. But when you look at what those lungs look like and what happens, you could certainly see how that could be a potential, right? Because they just can't move that stuff up and out as well. So there's more potential for inflammation during that weakened immune system period of time. And I think that's good to note because I think that rest period after a horse has been severely ill, we have to really think about that as being critical to the recovery, even though Absolutely. they seem better. Yeah. Absolutely. Because we can't see down there. So we don't know, but we know, you know, intuitively that that happens, but it's key to, to rest them for sure. This was asked a few times and it's asked often in practice, right? Is it normal for horses to cough a few times when they first start trotting? And it often resolves within, you know, a short period of time. Is that, is that considered, should we consider that to be okay? I would say no. Um, and, it, and it took me a while to, to kind of, now, now that I've spent a lot more time um, on asthma um, and w in talking with, with, you know, the internal medicine specialists, um, no, I mean, a cough like that isn't normal. I mean, if your horse coughs once, and then you never hear it again, I wouldn't worry about it. But if it's kind of, you know, regularly every time you start to work, that would suggest to me that we need to do some investigation. You know, could that horse have some very mild asthma? And keep in mind, you know, um, the owners out there, just keep in mind that we have, if we happen to have a horse with a very mild case of asthma, that's something that we can do something about now and potentially, hopefully, you know, avoid you know, five, 10 years down the road, ending up with a horse with, with severe asthma, because those are, are cases that are reversible. We can look, you know, very closely at their environment, we can treat them, and we can follow them. So I think it warrants investigation and a good examination. Okay, and we have time just for one more. And I think this probably does. Um, I think on one of your slides, somebody picked up on the fact that you said that inhalers for asthma are not effective. I actually, I saw it more as that they're not as effective as we might think. So it's delivery sure. systems and, I, and things. Yeah, no, and I'm sorry that we were kind of running out of time and I wanted to respect everybody's time. Um, so the inhalers that we've had available to us up until now um, have really been human inhalers, right? So we've had, you know, the same inhaler that you would use for your child or yourself or what we've been had available for inhalant therapy in the horse. And those are designed for humans. And if you think about how, if you're an asthmatic or you have somebody in your family, how you have to take that inhaler, you press the button and you have to breathe in really hard, really quickly to get that down into your lungs. And so when we give that to our horse, obviously we can't get them to take that deep breath. We have to have a special delivery system, which usually looks like some sort of spacer. And we hope that they breathe it in and that they get it deep in their lungs. Well, unfortunately the studies that have been done on this show that the majority of that medication from those human inhalers ends up kind of settling out in the back of the throat. So some, a small portion, 20% or so might get down to the lower airway, but a lot of it settles out in the back of the throat and get swallowed. Now it can still be effective because all of those medications have been looked at and they're systemically absorbed by the horse. So when the horse swallows the inhaled medication, they still get it into their bloodstream. It still has an anti-inflammatory effect, but we didn't get it where we wanted it, which was down in the lungs. Um, so we're not getting probably as good an effect as we would like. And the other thing is we're getting steroids systemically, which is, you know, can have some risks, right? And so that's just been the drawback of what we've had available. Okay, well, thank you so much for your time today. Your presentation was fantastic and many people have commented on your, your uh, presentation being very helpful to them. And thanks for joining us. And I hope someday you can join us here in Scottsville at the Genesee Valley Equine Clinic. <laughs> thank you guys. And I'm sorry I went a little bit long. No, that's great. I, like I said, it's, it's hard to know how long sometimes these are going to go so have a great day everybody thank you thank you and we're going to take a break right now of i'll give you 20 minutes we're all coming back at exactly 10 35 so this is your time for your donuts and we'll run the slideshow again please 
observe the sponsors who've helped us out. They're always with us at this seminar every year and we really appreciate them. See you in 20 minutes. Super, thank you. Thank you for helping me out there. So our next speaker this morning is going to be Dr. Gabrielle Farragasso. And many of you who have met Gabby, but I'm thinking for some of you, it might be the first time you've actually seen her face without a mask on it. So that's exciting. So Dr. Farragasso grew up in Montrose, Pennsylvania, most recently, and went to high school in Binghamton. So she's uh, actually semi a New York State resident, in my opinion. She attended Villanova for undergrad and then spent four years in veterinary school at the University of Pennsylvania. You might see after her name that she has a VMD, and that would be our first VMD here at Genesee Valley Equine Clinic. And that is the degree that is awarded to students who graduate from the University of Pennsylvania. They've always been a little bit unique. And um, she's been here with us since June. She's done her whole internship so far during COVID-19 and done it all with great enthusiasm. We're really, really enjoying working with Dr. Farragasso. Her horses are Willie and Lucky, and Lucky is retired quarter horse, and Willie is an appendix who she uses for hunter under sandal and kind of an all around horse in the quarter horse world. He is still living down with her parents, so he's not up here yet. Um, today, Gabby's gonna use some actual cases that she's seen 
while she's been working with us to talk to you about a very effective treatment for localized infections. And I'm going to have Dr. Faragasso take it away. Go ahead and share your screen. Hey, hello. Good morning. There's your face. <laughs> there we go. Yes. First time unmasked. All right. Let's see. I have a PowerPoint for you guys. Um, let's see. All right. Can you guys see it? So if it's just you, just go to yours. Yeah. Are we good? She's, we're having issues. Go, just go issues? No, we are. You're good. Mute us. I'm good. Can you hear me? Okay. Okay. Yes. Okay. All right. Um, so Dr. Liebeck, I told, told her to call me if there's anything going on um, with my presentation. Um, I'm going to turn the video off now just for kind of, um, I guess, save our bandwidth. Um, but here we go. So today I am going to talk to you guys about regional limb perfusion, um, which is a technique that we can do on the farm for horses that sustain a particular type of wound. So to kind of best illustrate this, I'm going to jump right into cases. Case one is Karen. So she is a 17-year-old thoroughbred mare, um, and she is a retired show jumper. On November 19th, she came in from the pasture with a wound on her right hind leg. Um, the barn manager addressed this very quickly. They put a bandage on it, put, a, um, put her in a stall to kind of keep her quiet, and then called Genesee Valley Equine immediately. So we were there probably within two hours, I would say. On physical exam, she was bright, alert, responsive. Um, her physical examination, so she had a normal temperature at 99.1. Her heart rate was a little bit elevated at 44. Normally the high end of normal is 40, but certainly stress or pain can kind of cause that to elevate. And her respiratory rate was 16. The rest of her physical examination was within normal limits. However, <laughs> she had this wound on her right hind leg um, that we characterized as kind of eight centimeters long by three centimeters wide, um, and it extended all the way down to the cannon bone. So that kind of cream tan little circle that you see in the center of her wound um, is actually her bone. And we were highly suspicious that this wound communicated with a tendon sheath. So when we kind of put pressure around the wound, um, there, there was this kind of yellow sticky fluid that came out of the bottom of it. And that is a little bit suspicious of synovial fluid. So before I lose you, I kind of paired up her wound um, with an artist's rendition of a horse's distal limb. And if you kind of look at the picture in the center, so you can see that the bone is kind of in the center, the pink structure um, on the bottom saying digital tendon sheath kind of shows the upper and lower limit of that flexor tendon sheath and that yellow circle is kind of the up, uppermost limit of the um, fetlock joint. So with her wound, we were kind of most concerned about that digital tendon sheath. And for those of you who don't know, a tendon sheath, it's kind of like a greased up sleeve for the horse's flexor tendon. So as the horse walks, they kind of extend and flex their fetlock joint. And that sleeve kind of prevents friction over the tendons and the bone. So it's important that it stays a very sterile, um, clean environment. And if it were to be um, penetrated, so with a laceration like Karen's or a puncture, um, we get worried that there's going to be some inflammation and um, kind of adhesions in the long term, which can cause your horse from ever being sound again. Um, so they're very scary. But we're going to put Karen on pause for a minute and talk about Madeline, who sustained a similar but different wound. So I kind of wanted to touch on both of them. So Madeline is a two-year-old thoroughbred filly, and she tripped in the barn aisle on December 8th. Initially, the barn staff thought that it was just an abrasion over the knee. Um, so they sprayed it with blue coat, bandaged it, and kind of popped her in a stall to calm down. A few hours later, upon you know closer examination, they revealed that this abrasion actually was a puncture um, that went deep into the carpus. And her intended occupation was a racehorse. Um, so they called us, and we probably saw the wound about four to six hours after it happened. Um, her physical examination, she too was very bright, alert, responsive. All of her vital parameters were very normal. And kind of besides this wound over her right front knee, um, she, she was kind of a happy camper. 
but she sustained a six centimeter by four centimeter laceration over the right front carpus. She too had this yellow fluid and Dr. Ayers and I were kind of like, well, is it serum? Is it synovial fluid? Um, kind of poking out at the distal aspect, so the bottom of the wound. But then once we moved that flap over her knee, we could actually see the bones of the middle carpal joint. So again, we were highly suspicious of communication with the kind of knee joint. And now just kind of an overview. So what is the main concern with these two wounds? I've alluded to it several times, proximity to synovial structures. And a synonym for synovial structures, you could think of joint or tendon sheath. So why? Why are these wounds concerning? So they're not like a paper cut where you can put a Band-Aid on it, kind of 24 hours, you're back to normal, right? So these are supposed to be sterile, very clean environments. If they get infected from a wound or a puncture, they can develop septic arthritis, which is very, very painful. They can develop contralateral limb laminitis. So horses are kind of meant to stand on four legs. And if they're only standing on three, it kind of puts the other limbs in jeopardy. To kind of address these wounds systemically, we have to hit them hard with antibiotics. And unfortunately, the antibiotics that we like to prescribe can affect the kidneys negatively. So is the horse going to be able to handle the antibiotics? Are they going to be able to handle the NSAID? So the banamine or the butte that we're going to want to keep them on. We all know that, you know, horses sometimes if they get too many NSAIDs can develop right dorsal colitis. So a type of colic. Um, if they're feeling punky and painful, are they going to want to eat? Are they going to be able to kind of handle those NSAIDs again without developing gastric ulcerations? And then kind of long-term, these horses you know, they could be so painful that they may be laying down more. Are they going to develop bed sores? If we bandage them improperly, are they going to develop, you know, ulcers under the bandage? So lots to consider with these wounds. It's not very straightforward. And that leads them to be very life-threatening. And I unfortunately can be quite blunt. So um, just, you know, be prepared. So these wounds in a retrospective study that came out of Australia, so this referral center kind of looked at all of the cases with these type of wounds that they saw over a period of time, only 84% of them survived short term. And then of the ones that they were able to follow up with, only 54% of them returned to athletic function. So of all these horses, half of them were able to be ridden again. We'll say not even up to their kind of ability that they were at before the injury, but ridden. And then the other half of them kind of became pasture pets. Um, negative prognostic indicators. So kind of if we see this, it's bad news bears for the horse would be bony or tendon involvement. So if Madeline had kind of fractured any of those bones in her carpus, or if Karen had kind of lacerated or cut her deep digital flexor tendon or her superficial digital flexor tendon, we would be having different conversations with the owners. And I'm sorry, it'd be a little bit more abysmal, but when I see these wounds, I like to offer owners kind of three kind of tiers of treatment plan. So gold standard, I'm gonna recommend that you send your horse to a referral center. And around here, we like to use Cornell, we use Penn, my alma mater, or sometimes like Rudin and Riddle in Saratoga. And the gold standard treatment for these type of wounds would be to go to one of these referral centers with a three to $5,000 estimate. I know, take a deep breath, it's a lot. Um, and it kind of is case dependent, but things that they would do would be um, take radiographs of the wound, induce the horse under general anesthesia, go in arthroscopically actually to the tendon or the joint, lavage it copiously. So try to get all of that bacteria out, leave antibiotics in, perform regional limb perfusion, start them on antibiotics and do bandage changes. And the kind of benefit of sending them there is you have board certified specialists with your horse every step of the way. Now, we would never suggest that you put yourself in a financially irresponsible situation for the health of your horse. So what we can offer here at Genesee Valley, our kind of top tier treatment plan, um, with, which comes with an estimate of still one to $2,000, would be to bring your horse into our hospital facility, still take radiographs, distend the joint and take a sample, you know, see, do we see infection? And then perform something we call regional limb perfusions. Mostly um, the plan is kind of three days in a row, um, with one type of antibiotic. And then we'd also start on intravenous antibiotics, pain medications, perform bandage changes. Now we aren't board certified, but I checked this morning and combined, we have 98 years of veterinary experience between all of us and our logo is obviously the best, so. And then the third tier option, which is, you know, 
um, most economical, and it's not a bad option. We're still going to treat your horse with everything we have in our power, just for a lower price tag of around $500. So we'd encourage radiographs. We could still start your horse on intravenous or oral antibiotics, perform bandage changes, and we'd teach you how to do the bandage changes, um, and then encourage your horse to do stall risks. So with kind of all of these cases, but specifically this one, we're gonna want constant communication in the form of recheck. So either you send a photo in, we're gonna come out to the to the farm, take a look at the leg or wherever the wound is, um, or you could bring the horse into the clinic for rechecks. So back to our cases, both owners elected to bring these horses to Genesee Valley for medical management. Um, treatment plan, we kind of hit them with that multimodal approach initially um, using our treatment facilities, which are a little bit cleaner, I'm sorry to say, than most of your barns. And we also have a few more hands handy to help us. So kind of to start off, we'll do pain management, antibiotics, and then wound management with these regional limb perfusions. So what is a regional limb, right? So it's a technique used to deliver high concentrations of antibiotics to joints, so synovial structures, or infected inflamed tissues. Mostly we talk about this in terms of distal extremities and we use cephalic, saphenous or palm, palmer, oh wow, plantar digital veins. So I've tried to indicate those with the um, arrows on the screen. Pros that this technique can be done on the farm with materials that we carry on the truck. And also you do not have to penetrate into a joint and risk introducing further bacteria into this sterile Kind of space. So if by chance the wound is not in the joint or the tendon sheath, we don't necessarily want to drag any bacteria from the outside in. Cons being it can be very difficult to identify um, the vein if there is a lot of swelling in that area. Catheters can sometimes blow the vein and then it does require some level of patient cooperation. So if we're sedating your horse time and time again and she's still trying to kick us, especially with those hind legs, we might have to abort mission. So the procedure itself. First and foremost, we're gonna perform a physical exam and make sure your horse is safe to sedate. Then we're gonna clip and clean the area of intended venipuncture. So one of those three veins that I kind of indicated in the previous slide. And then we're gonna apply a tourniquet above the area of interest. The, here's a video of, I believe this is Dr. Pell putting on a tourniquet um, for a regional limb perfusion. And you can see the area there that's been clipped and prepped. So we kind of leave the prep on to make it um, as clean as possible. And then using a butterfly catheter, we are going to penetrate into the vein and inject either amicacin or gentamicin, which are our two kind of antibiotics of choice, um, and a little bit of saline, a little bit of carbocaine into the vein. Um, then we are going to remove the catheter and apply a Band-Aid over the site we just injected. We're going to leave that tourniquet on for about 20 minutes so that antibiotic and saline and carbocaine can really kind of hit the intended area. Um, and there's been studies to show that it only takes about 20 minutes for the antibiotic to reach the kind of effective levels that we need in these wounds. So then after these regional limb perfusions, we're gonna send the horse home and it is going to be kind of an intense management on the owner's part. So depending on the wound, you're gonna to need to do bandage changes every day to every other day, depending on the amount of discharge. Initially using sterile materials because we don't wanna introduce any more bacteria into the wounds. Um, but then over time, as the wounds kind of granulate in, we may be able to switch to a lighter bandage beneath the standing wrap. So we would kind of like weekly photo updates and monitoring kind of throughout this process. So now the results, I know that's what you're most interested in. Case one, Karen. So initially on November 19th, we have these images, the wound, and we did take x-rays. You can see the gas lucency over the cannon bone there and over her little slump bone. But then as time went on after the three regional limbs, she went home, the owner was meticulous about bandaging, and we were able to start seeing this wound granulate in. She stayed comfortable on minimal pain meds, and she kind of hasn't been non-weight bearing lame since. So we have kind of more pictures here. Um, like I said, her owner was amazing about sending us updates. You can see these wounds kind of granulating in, healing, scarring nicely. Um, and then case two over the knee, initially, we did the same thing. So we took x-rays at the time of the visit. You can kind of see the um, red arrows in the center of the x-ray kind of indicate the three joints of the carpus. Um, hers that we were most suspicious of was that middle arrow. And then you can see the black gas pockets kind of all around that joint. So we're kind of suspicious that it's in that joint. But then over time, the wound starts granulating in. 
Um, and so the wound on the bottom in these pictures here um, are kind of the initial uh, wound over the knee, but then you'll see that she did unfortunately develop a bandage sore um, kind of above the initial wound, which was causing her some discomfort. So kind of meticulous bandaging um, is very important and then patient cooperation too. So she was constantly one that was trying to get her bandage off. Um, so it made it a little bit more difficult for the staff trying to bandage her. But um, both horses, I'm happy to say, are kind of healing nicely. Karen is sound and happy, and we still think Madeline might be a racehorse. So in summary, um, call your veterinarian if you notice any wound in close proximity to a joint or synovial structure. Um, so joints, tendon sheets, where are these? I circled some of them on the bottom of the skeleton. You can see there's a lot. So foot, ankle, knee, elbow, and then tendon sheets kind of up and down the limbs. Um, be ready for a long-term financial and emotional commitment. You know, just because your horse made it 24 hours after we see them doesn't necessarily mean that you're kind of clear, right? So these horses can take a turn um, in a few days, you know, if the infection hasn't kind of um, kind of reached its, you know, most detrimental phase if your horse is, is not able to handle the antibiotics, et cetera, et cetera. Um, a quick note, if you notice a foreign object in a joint, please don't remove it. Leave it there till we get there so we can take an x-ray with an in and see where it actually goes. And then if you aren't sure if it needs to be seen, call us. Um, we do not mind consulting. We don't mind coming out and taking a look and just giving you the peace of mind, you know, that your, your horse is you're going to be okay. So... Thank you. That is kind of all I have. Those were my references. I will turn my video back on. I'm sorry, that was a little bit long. Welcome back, everybody. Uh, Gabby, I have not a single question in the Q&A, but I have a question so that we oh can clarify it for everybody. <laughs> no. Oh dear. No. Um, what is iatrogenic? That was in oh. your slide about the bandage thing. What is What does iatrogenic mean? So it's something that we accidentally caused, we being the a human, um, the horse didn't do it on its own. Like we induced it. We or the, yeah, whoever was applying the bandages induced yeah. it. Yeah, we okay. personally didn't induce that one, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, are you still screen sharing? Uh, you are screen sharing, I sure am. Okay. There you go. Does, okay, let, oh, wait a minute. There might be one question, maybe. I think it's, oh dear. <laughs> what? Oh, can you tell the first thing? I can't. There, now I'm more in view. Uh, it just says anonymously, Gabby, terrifically interesting presentation. Oh, thank you. I now you can that. enjoy your weekend. Yes. <laughs> okay. All right, next up today is Dr. Lydia Gray, who's joining us from Smart Pack. Um, she has been here in Scottsville with us at the seminar many times, and we are glad to have her speaking. She's, um, we had really actually intended to ask Dr. Gray to speak this year, and we're hoping we would be in person, but I knew she would do well virtually, and we've seen her, we've rehearsed a few times with Dr. Gray. So Dr. Gray is now with research, uh, the research and medical director at SmartPAC, and she's been there for about 15 years. Prior to that, she had some time in private practice, and she is a University of Illinois graduate. Um, today it's six degrees in Chicago. That's what I have. What do you have? That's what about, I have. About six degrees. Yeah. And she has a horse, of course. Um, her horse is Stan Lee. Apparently some Marvel references there that I'm not aware of, but Ben from RIT, he's aware of what that is. That's a four-year-old Dutch warm blood. And very interestingly, his job will eventually be precisely 80% dressage, 15% driving and 5% side saddle. Dr. Gray is going to talk to us today about the use of CBD in horses and be ready for a lot of um, glossary terms that you're going to get to know how to pronounce. And uh, we're going to learn a lot more about weed right now, I guess. All right. So let me share my screen. I want to say too that uh, that presentation Dr. Ferg also did on uh, regional limb perfusion was fantastic because uh, Stan is gonna need that soon for a different problem. Um, so it was good to um, go through it. All right, does it look good? Everybody can see? Okay, thumbs up. All right, let me just hide my floating. There we go, okay. So um, yeah, terminology, um, it, usually it's boring, but you're gonna want it this time. I know that's where a lot of the questions are. We'll talk about the research. I get a lot of questions there, 
I only have one slide on, maybe two slides on regulatory, um, a little bit of QA. For those of you that are showing, I'm telling you what the uh, USEF or US Equestrian and FEI are saying right now, and then give you a few resources. So cannabis, and if you had asked me in vet school, if I thought I would ever be talking about cannabis, the answer would be no. Um, so let's, let's explain this. Um, there are, so, so there's a plant that its genus name is cannabis and there's two to three, it's controversial uh, species of that, sativa and indica. Sativa is the, the main one that we're worried about. So some varieties of, of the cannabis sativa have been bred over hundreds, thousands of years to have high amounts of THC and low amounts of CBD. And those cultivars are marijuana. And then others have been bred to have high amounts of CBD and low amounts of THC. And that's what we call hemp. So think of it this way, cannabis is the umbrella term for marijuana and hemp, but marijuana and hemp are two different things, even though they come from the same genus. Starting off great, I know. All right, so for those that are more visual learners, hemp, high in CBD, that's the non-psychoactive, marijuana, high in THC, that's the stuff that gets you high. Notice here at the bottom, it says hemp contains 0.3% or less of THC. That's the FDA's, the federal requirement. That's their definition. That's one of the resources I'm giving you at the end. You can go to the FDA and read to your heart's content about CBD, but that's their definition. If it's low THC, it's hemp. So then I've been throwing these words out and let's talk more about THC and CBD. For those of you who um, have been dying to impress your, your friends and relatives with this quick way of saying these words, I gave you some uh, phonetic pronunciations in there. So nobody says what THC is, but if you want to, it's tetrahydrocannabinol. And then CBD is short for cannabidiol. And again, there's those definitions for you. THC is what's in marijuana. It's the woo, high stuff. And CBD is in hemp, and it's our, it's our um, health and wellness ingredient. So another term to learn the pronunciation of is cannabinoids. So THC and CBD are both considered what's called cannabinoids. And these are just compounds in the plant. We're talking about phytocannabinoids here. Phyto means plant. Cannabinoids are the compounds which act on certain receptors in the body. And there's lots of them, but CB1 and CB2 are the most well-known, the most well-studied. So if the cannabinoids come from a plant, they're phytocannabinoids. If they come from your body, your body makes cannabinoids, then they're endocannabinoids. And now you see, I've crossed out the synthetic cannabinoids. While you're shopping, if you run across those, any, anything synthetic cannabinoid, synthetic CBD, synthetic cannabidiol run far away because um, the FDA considers cannabinoids made in the lab to be, lab to be um, unsafe. So sticking now or deep dive into the plant-based cannabinoids, uh, they, so they naturally occur in the cannabis plant in the, the stems, the leaves, the flowers, what they, what's called the aerial parts of the plant. Uh, but it's not just in, in uh, the cannabis plant, it's in echinacea, which you might have heard of for, it's used for um, immune support. Uh, it's in tea and black truffles. So um, those are the things that's highest in, but it's, it's in other plants. The, the range of different cannabinoids, I, I've seen over a hundred, I've seen over 80. I, I went conservative and said there's over 60 different cannabinoids have been identified from just the cannabis plant. And the two that are most studied are the ones we've talked about so far, the CBD and the THC. And it, while it may seem new to us and to a lot of people, look at the date that CBD 
was first isolated and identified in the lab, 1942. So um, it's, it's, it's been around, it's been known for a long time. That's not a new thing. We'll get to what's new soon. Turning to the ones in your body, the endocannabinoids, they bind to the same receptors. And again, we're finding more and more of these. These are much more um, recent. The anandamide is a, was isolated and identified the chemical structure, identified about 2000 or so. And the other one, which we all just call 2AG. There's nobody, there's maybe one person can pronounce it. Um, it was like 2002 maybe. And they're, they're finding more ones every year. Um, we're gonna talk next about the endocannabinoid system. And this was not a thing when I was in veterinary school. And I just learned about it a few years ago when I when Smartpak said, um, we see this ingredient that's, um, you know, we, we were looking at it and then in 2018, the farm bill got passed and changed the regulatory landscape. And so then it became um, uh, possible to pursue it. And, and so that's when I became, began to, to study up on the endocannabinoid system, which is fascinating. Um, again, the best known receptors are the CB1 and CB2. I have a picture of them in a horse. And, and so what we're learning is whether it's a phytocannabinoid or an endocannabinoid, um, some work on just CB1 or just CB2. Others may work on them both, but like they're really effective on one and not so effective on the other. And then there's, there's ones that while they're working on one receptor, they're, they're, they're causing the other one to be sort of blocked or changed or deactivated. So the, that's why I'm saying the endocannabinoid system, not only for what it does, but the pieces, parts of it are also very interesting. Here's a few of the places that they're the known, the most known receptors are. And the important thing to understand is that the CB1 would be where THC binds and has activity. And so you'll see a lot of those in the uh, brain and central nervous system. And then the CB2 is where your CBD will bind and have activity. And so you'll see more of those in like um, the, the musculoskeletal system and other areas. I'm used to taking questions during a talk. So it's very weird, A, not to see anybody and B, not to have someone go, that made no sense, can you say it again? But I'm assuming you guys are collecting questions and we'll get a bunch at the end. And let me just do one thing. I'm just taking a break. This is a break for myself right now. I'm gonna turn my phone ringer on. So in case anybody from um, Genesee Valley needs to contact me, it'll ding. Okay, so now let's talk about the endocannabinoid system itself. And if I could sum it up in one word, it would be homeostasis. I know, pick a big word, right? So homeostasis is just, your body's stability. It's, it's the way it works normally. And you're, a lot of, there's a lot of systems in your body whose job is to make sure that all, everything runs normally. I guess it's like, I just thought of this. My group at SmartPak hate when I do this, but it's kind of like the computer in your car. It's constantly testing, sending out feelers and testing things. And when something isn't working right, you know, it, it sends up a, alert. So here it's, if there's an injury or an illness, then it, it kicks in to help it return to that normal. And what we're finding is the, the cannabinoids from plants can fit smoothly into this normal internal system to help the body return to normal. And we love when supplement ingredients just help the body return to normal. All right, so you made it through the whole terminology and definitions section. Whew. Um, on to research, and I get a ton of questions on this. So if you've ever gone to PubMed, which is a great source place to look for research, um, you can get the citation, you know, author's names and what, what um, the name, of the, the title of the piece and um, what journal it was in. You can get sometimes an abstract but unless you subscribe to that paper or buy it right then or have a friend, a veterinary friend get it for you, um, you're not gonna be able to read the whole thing. 
But anyway, if you type in cannabinoids, what I have in quotes there, in, into PubMed's search box, you get over 28,000 papers. So for people who say, but there's no research, well, there is research. If you type in CBD or cannabidiol, I came up with almost 13,000 papers. Now, when you add canine in front of it or dog, whichever, I get about 250, which is not bad. And But when you add equine in front of it, in front of any of those words, there's just seven. And I put a little asterisk there because one of them was um, a topical CBD. So really six. Um, I don't intend for you to read this, but it's just an example of the papers that are up as far as uh, canine and feline research. And you'll see they're already looking into, they've kind of gone through the pharmacokinetics, which is when you put an ingredient, a drug, a medication, something into a, a, the body, how long does it take the body to metabolize it? How long does it take to clear it from the, from the body, um, to eliminate it, that sort of thing. So that's all been done. The safety work has been done, and now they're moving into the efficacy part of it. And so there, there are uh, facilities, places, I think Colorado State maybe did one, Cornell, Auburn, that are looking into what con conditions, what issues, what problems, common problems do dogs and cats have that we might want to use this for. And so one of them would be um, joint issues. Um, of course, you'll see a lot of, of epilepsy there. This is a coworker of mine at SmartPak. I said, I told her, I'm like, you have a dog, everyone at SmartPak has a dog, but I said, you have a famous dog. Um, I just need a picture of a dog for my slide. So there you go. He's a, a national dock diving dog. So they go all around the country where they used to before COVID, um, diving off docks into the water to get something. I don't really understand it, but anyway, it looks great. So for horses, um, I, there are four really interesting uh, papers that I found. And look at the third one down. It says doping control analysis. If you don't think, if someone has told you that, oh, there's no way to test if your horse has, has been given CBD, just go ahead and show. And now that's one of the first things that they test for in horses is the pharmacokinetics. Um, so there, there is, believe me, there is absolutely a way to test for CBD in the blood because we did a study and when we got done with the, the safe use portion of it, I had all the blood work sent to Colorado State because Dr. Daniel Gustafson there, he's the guy that has figured out a way to take the horse blood serum or plasma and pull out the uh, CBD in it and actually detect down to the, you know, microgram, the amount of, of CBD in it, he can tell you. So um, it's, it's, to, it's absolutely possible. So we have those studies, but what's also interesting is that there are some coming out because when we designed ours, I knew there were other studies out there. And so I uh, contacted those, those um, researchers and said, you know, can you talk to me? And this Murray's Day paper, which I'll show you in a second, was very helpful because it told me when CBD levels peak in the blood after you feed it. The answer is two hours. Uh, Tarleton State, I'm just sitting on pens and needles waiting for that one. And then Oklahoma State, I swear there's have been in, in the works for three years. So um, that should come out anytime. Of course, I would like ours to be the first published the, the, you'll see the one pager summary in a minute and that's available now on our website, but right now it's a race to get these submitted to um, journals and accepted and all the edits done and to get them um, published. So here's the Murray State one and theirs is done in three phases. The first one is done, the pilot. They just gave a single dose and they collected the blood and said, yep, it gets in there. And then Project two, the pharmacokinetics, is um, giving different doses, more horses, and they actually built a curve out. So you see that the peak was at two hours, and that was a really well-designed um, study, and it, it helps the rest of us doing the research in it 
to know how to conduct our studies. And so project three is, is going on right now and they're doing it for a lot longer, three months and more horses. And they're looking at um, uh, when you scare the horse, do they have a less of a response when they're on CBD and do they move differently? So that's gonna be really cool when it comes out. Here's ours. Ours, we just did a, a, a safe use and not any effect components, but we wanted to know that it, that it was okay to give this to horses because that, that work, I hadn't seen it yet. And so ours was a, a two month study and we had 10 horses in the control group and 10 in the treatment group and it was double blinded. And we said, look at um, blood work. So CBC chemistry, look at the um, ataxia, which is a, a fancy word for coordination. So the test, there's a, a scale, a standard test of walking in a circle both way, a tight circle. And then there's a scale and that's on the, uh, that's table two for the ataxia there on the left. And there's a, also a scale for the sedation. sedation. So it's like, if you give them this, do they, how does their level of alertness change? So like zero, no change and to five would be like, you know, in a coma. So, um, and, and then the results was that it, it didn't cause any, I mean, you, it, there were no, no effects seen. So that's really great. Oh, regulatory. So I mentioned in 2018, the farm bill removed hemp from the Controlled Substances Act. So now marijuana is still controlled it's still a schedule, uh, I don't know, three, I forget, because we don't deal with it. And hemp is completely out of it. The problem is hemp regulation now falls under state laws and the states weren't really prepared for that. And they're all like, oh, danger, Will Robinson. So the, the point to take away here is if you wonder why CBD is ex it becoming a thing right now, it's because of what happened in December of 2018. All right. And then also take these key points away. Hemp is not marijuana and CBD is not marijuana. That 0.3% THC is what you should be looking at, looking at to make sure that you get the product you want. Um, make sure when you're shopping that there are no drug claims for a CBD product. And then um, you probably ought to know your state's laws about you know, what you can do and which, who, who you can talk to and, and where you can buy it and all that. So I wanted you to know that we follow the NASC, that's the National Animal Supplement Council guidelines. Um, we correctly label any product with CBD in it as a <laughs> dosage form animal health product. So there's two kinds of supplements. There's feed, like, like a host supplement, that's feed, biotin, um, uh, multivitamins, vitamin E, and then there's non-feeds. So those are your things that, that don't have nutrients in it. So that'd be anything with glucosamine, like a joint supplement. Um, omega-3 would be a feed. So clearly CBD is not a nutrient and it falls into the non-feed category. Um, we don't make drug claims. We don't make egregious claims of any kind. And that's when you see companies getting uh, busted for selling CBD supplements. It's not because they're selling CBD supplements. It's because they're making claims like cures cancer, um, treats diabetes, you know, prevents whatever osteoarthritis. You can't say those things. One, they're not true, and and two, those are for drugs. So um, the when the when the FDA is sending out letters to companies, that's why they're sending them because they're finding language on the label or on the website or whatever in print material that's um, over the top. And that needs to be your, if something sounds too good, you know that saying, it probably is. So stay away from those companies. Uh, we also submit adverse event reports. That's if there's um, health side effects. And uh, we stay away from those synthetic ones that I told you the FDA has warned everyone about. And then uh, this is really important. We meet the product testing requirements. So they, the NASC set out guidelines for both the raw ingredient, like before it goes into the, su the supplement and then the finished ingredient. So after it's made and put into pellets and put in the buckets, like we take out some randomly and send to a lab independent third party to test it. 
you have to verify that it is in fact um, hemp and not marijuana because it's less than 0.3% THC. You, you have to show that it has the amount of CBD that you say it does. And then you have to show that it doesn't have dangerous substances like mycotoxins. That's an extra one that we do that they don't require uh, microorganisms, bacteria, that there are no pesticides and no heavy metal, like your lead and your arsenics and all that. So we do, we do all that and any good CBD um, uh, seller will do all those things. All right, switching to competition guidelines. If you compete in recognized US equestrian shows, um, I put two links here for you and I've shown you the page in their little drugs and medications guidelines. It's a, it's a long, narrow little brochure that they added um, this is the 2020 because the 2021 isn't out yet, but they added cannabinoids to, to USEF. So um, my, my advice on this is if you show recognized because we don't have the pharmacokinetics of CBD all worked out yet, um, we don't know to what level USEF is saying they're testing to. Um, usually when you have a, a prohibited substance, they say, oh, you know, discontinue, withdraw for seven to 10 days before competition. In this case, because we don't know how long it takes to clear the system, I say if, if you're competing in a recognized show, just don't use, don't give that horse CBD. It's just, it's not worth it because it's embarrassing. You get, I guess you get your name printed in their what, somewhere materials and they find you and you can't show and eh, it's just a mess. You don't want that. For um, FEI, they, they have the same guideline. You can't use, you, you can't use exogenous or phytocannabinoids regardless of their source, which is the same for USEP. So FDA cares about the source. So marijuana, no, hemp, yes. The, sh the show organizations don't care. They're like cannabinoids, don't care if they're THC or CBD, cannot use. And this is the link that you go to for anything. If you want to know anything about, um, can I give this, if I'm showing FEI, you use this link. And it's a live database. And, but I've learned to put in your word in different versions. Cause like if you put in CBD, it doesn't come up. But if you put in cannabidiol, comes up. And then um, just some resources for you. If you want to read about the endocannabinoid system, Dr. Silver had a great, really long article. Um, it be almost two years ago now in this journal. And then if you want to read about um, the ongoing studies at Oklahoma State and uh, Tarleton, that's those two links there, you can, you can see like how many horses and how long and what actually they're looking at. And then if you can't fall asleep some night and you, you need to have some heavy reading to, um, you know, make you sleepy, I, I strongly recommend going to this site on the FDA's website and every question you could possibly have about uh, cannabis and cannabis derived products uh, is there and you can read it and I guarantee you two to seven minutes and you will be out like a light. I think that's all I had. I felt like I talked fast because I didn't, I want to make sure that I didn't go over and I want to leave time for questions and um, I hope I did not put anyone to sleep. We're back. All right, Hello. we're back. <laughs> all right. So so um, I can stop sharing. Conditions there we go. What would you use CBD for? All right. What? Okay. So I think we're probably all really curious. It's great um, to know what the product is exactly. And I think that was really helpful. I'm certainly certain it was helpful to all of the veterinarians here at Genesee Valley Equine Clinic listening today and would make us all feel more comfortable when clients are thinking, considering using the product. So what conditions would be best what, when would we use CBD and when are people finding it 
most useful. I guess there, there's a question that's going to okay. encompass a lot of them. Okay, and you heard me say earlier that um, we are very careful not to make drug claims. Correct. So, right. So, so supplements do not treat or prevent um, conditions, diseases, but but they can. It can support um, the musculoskeletal system, like joints. So it it can support comfort. If you have a horse that uh, is uncomfortable, then experiencing discomfort. We've over the years, we've learned how to say things in a safe way, in a regulatory compliant way. And so, discomfort, a horse is uncomfortable. Um, that's what we we uh, recommend it for. The other one would be um, if you want to maintain a horse's uh, um, being cool, calm, and collected. You know, if they're if they're uh, experiencing excess nervousness or anxiety, you could try it. Uh, our the product that we went out with, the first one, we went with 150 milligrams once a day because we looked at the entire market. We looked at the research. I called researchers and that, that amount, that serving size was in the middle. So the important thing about serving size and what to use it for is you just try it on your horse, start low. This is not one, CBD is not one that you would start with the loading dose. You, know, you hear that with like a glucosamine or something. You start low and you, you give it for a while, two weeks, four weeks, and you see if there's the results you're looking for. And if not, then you can, you can up it. So if you have, if you, you know, you can use it just for health and well-being. So, but if there's something that you want to give it to your horse for, a GI would be the other thing that, the, like the top three that comes to mind, then just give it and, and see, what, see what the results are and if you're happy. Uh, this wasn't, I'm not fielding this question from the Q&A, but I am wondering if if there are topical CBD products available for use in the equine. I know there seem to be a fair number of those out for people that you can buy at any local gas station, but are, is it being used topically? Do you know? Yes, yes. And we actually carry two products and I purchased one myself. Um, and it was, it's by um, um, Absorbing. So it's a very well- known brand, been around a long time. And so I, I trust them. And so when I'm shopping for CBDs and, and, and CBD products, and what I rec recommend for everyone here is purchase from a brand, you know, because there's a lot of, you can, like you just said, they're on every street corner and gas station, whatever. There's a lot of companies that because of the deregulation of hemp have jumped into the market to try and make a quick buck. Right. And who, who are they? They're, you know, fly by nights and they have no reputation. And so they may say and do things that are not ethical, maybe not even legal, but they don't care because they're just out to make a buck for a short period of time and then run. Um, but companies like Absorbing that has a topical, theirs is with liniment. So you get the effects of CBD and the effects of liniment together. Um, they're not going anywhere. And so they'll stand behind their product. And if, if, if they feel comfortable putting together a, a CBD topical product, then it's, it's a good product. Yeah, that's good advice. I think that a lot of times we feel comfortable with a certain brand. And if you look behind my head, there's, you can probably see that's, we've had a lot of experience with certain products from those companies and then mm -hmm. they become things we begin to trust. So I like that advice of yeah. if you're the shopping for CBD, maybe shop for somebody who's also made something else that you found to be of good quality. Yeah. Um, somebody wanted you to clarify that um, okay. our bodies create their own version of CBD. So and dot what we would call as that's endogenous CBD. Mm -hmm. And I guess they're wondering yeah, just to clarify, do our bodies do that as part of our own neurotransmitters? Uh, I don't know that they're called neurotransmitters because they're they're your body's homeo the part of your body's homeostatic mechanism. It's the system throughout the body, head to toe, that that, that checks in and says, is is everything okay here? Is are we feeling right? It, I mean, every system, immune, GI, musculoskeletal, respiratory, skin, mental. I, it's just a constant check-in. Is my body functioning 
at it where it's supposed to be or is something out of whack, out of balance. And if it's out of balance, the body produces more endocannabinoids to rebalance. And so the feeling is if maybe you're, you need more cannabinoids and your body can produce, it's almost like, like vitamin C, you know, older horses, when they get, as they age, they can't keep up with the need for vitamin C as an antioxidant. And so as whole horses age, you can add in some vitamin C to meet their needs for it. And it's kind of like that with CBD. If there's something going on, discomfort, excess nervousness, they might not be able to keep up with the cannabinoid need with what their body makes. And so if you supply some external exogenous phytocannabinoids from the cannabis plant, CBD, then the cannabinoid system can reestablish that proper balance. Does that make things better or worse? It did, it did for me. And I have to say, I never really thought about cannabinoids in that way before. So that's interesting. A uh, question that came up, and I'm sure this is one that's been asked by you before. So mares that are mares who are often are, uh, you know, what you were just describing about nervousness and, you know, certain times that they're not so, behaving so well. Would, would a mare who's been on Regumate benefit from additionally being on CBD? And I know you can't say for certain because maybe there's no study done on this. Is that a horse to try this on? A mare that's been having to be maintained on a oral progesterone, would they maybe benefit from CBD? I can't see a reason not to do it while they're on Regumate from my Therio side of things. Mm -hmm. I don't think there's a problem with it interacting. And I'm not sure that's what the question was, but maybe these mares don't need Regumate. Maybe we could try them on CBD. Well, you, you answered part of brilliantly. Um, you actually you covered lots of it. So there, there has not been a study with mares on Regumate um, and CBD. And it probably is not gonna be one of the earliest studies. So it'll be done, but it won't be one of the earliest ones. Uh, make sh I, I, will, I will add this, that there's certainly not a study yet in pregnant mares. So that's a whole different ball game. Let's, so let's take them off the table completely. Whenever a horse is being given a prescription medication, I always, always tell the owner, talk to your vet about this. Don't do this on the sly or slip this in or, you know, talk to your vet, have a conversation, an open conversation. Say, look, I read this. I want to do this, but my mayor is on, you know, regular What do you think? And, and get their feedback. This is your vet and your horse. And you're supposed to be able to have this conversation about, about things, especially when they're on a prescription medication. Um, that said, if, if everybody's in agreement, it goes back to what I said earlier, you know, you, with CBD, you kind of have to try things and experiment and see how it goes. You may notice no change. Well, then you can save yourself some money. You may notice a great change. And then, and then maybe you pull off the regumate and you save yourself some money that way. So you kind of with CBD have to experiment a little. And I, that I, I'm a little bit nervous saying that about CBD because we're gonna be taken the wrong way, but um, that's, that's what you do with CBD. We, we don't know a lot of stuff. And as long as you speak with your veterinarian, especially if you're on a prescription med, try it. So prescription med, that's good, to, good for pe people to understand. This is not a prescription medication. Correct. No. If they were to order it from somewhere, SmartPack, for example, there's no veterinarian going to have to approve anything. No. So um, I recommend talking to your vet and telling them that you're going to do it. They need to know that they need to be in the loop. Okay. Um, this question, I think you've, you've addressed most of it. I'm just going to make sure. So somebody's asking before you finish, can you summarize what CBD may actually help with? And I think you did that a couple questions ago. You'd like to for GI, musculoskeletal, anxiousness. Mm -hmm. um, you suggested uses. You talked about what SmartPack provides was 150 milligrams, I believe, but you can mm -hmm. go up and down a little from there. And are there any studies in horses at all that's showing that it actually has been useful the for, certain, studies, for a certain thing? Yeah, yeah. So the uh, Oklahoma State study is specifically about arthritis and um I, I they've been working on it for three years i i don't know why it's not been published yet i mean it, it seriously could be any day so 
the and the resources page that last one before the sleeping horses sleeping yes. beauty um that link to just a newspaper article that interviews the two researchers and that that's as most as anybody in the public knows about that study so read that and it's it explains uh, how many horses they're using and how long and how they're testing for um the control group versus the treatment group and the soundness. So, and then so you that, said the, you said the mayor study won't be early on. What no. do you think, what do you think uh, the researchers are looking at first for horses? What are the Arthro big studies? Arthritis joint. Yeah. So performance, pain. improving performance. Yeah. I think they, the title of there's something about chronic pain, okay. not really improving performance, but just it, it if you think about it, it might be just making your retired senior horse comfortable in their last years. You know, I kind of wish I'd had it for mine. So he, he, he did not have the benefit of CBD in his last couple of months. And I wish he had a, had, um, so yeah, so, so comfort, um, and, um, the Tarleton one is looking at, uh, the Tarleton university, state university is looking at, uh, like cribbing and weaving, obsessive oh, compulsive disorder. That would be great. Yeah, I think it could have some impact there. Being separate than, you know, nervous and anxious and excitable and all that. That would that would be that would be nice to know about. I know. Um discuss the quality of the carrier oil for CBD. Um so CBD, there's research that says when you give CBD, if you can give it with a fat oil it is more bioavailable it's absorbed better so i don't think we know yet if there's a certain kind of oil that is how can i see how many you have? more better than any other so ours is in a, uh, a hemp seed oil a lot of them you'll see in coconut oil um, but you can put them in any any oil but now hemp seed oil is different from hemp oil. The one little word seed makes it very, very different because hemp seed oil is just pressed seeds, hemp seeds, and it's like flax seed oil or chia seed oil or any kind of oil. It's just the nutrients, okay. the vitamins, the minerals, the protein, the fat, whatever is in the seeds. But hemp oil is the oil that is made from the aerial parts of the hemp plant and the hemp oil has CBD in it. So it's gonna be pricier and it's gonna be, it's, it's, it's completely different from hemp seed oil. Okay. Somebody wants to know specifically the products that are available from Smart Pack, <laughs> which is nice for you. I, yeah, but I'm probably the worst person because I, <laughs> I am not merchandising. I, I know that we launched a Smart and Simple CBD pellets. We have two more coming because I am involved in product development. I know we have a brand called Naked Leaf and theirs has, they their maintenance serving is 300 milligrams. Um, we have one from MVP called BioBalance and theirs is a hundred milligrams. And then we have two topicals. So not very many because we're very, very picky about who's we pick up. I mean, we have to believe in their CBD as much as we believe in ours. So we don't have 15 CBD products. We have two third parties in ours. Okay. I always say that's good. When somebody's not carrying all 20, it means they actually paid attention. We take a long time. We really look at these closely. All right. Sandy's asking, what happens when CBD1 or CBT2 receptors are blocked? Does anything else block those receptors? I am certainly not the right person to answer that. And I don't even know if the people that are studying the re at the receptor level know that. That's exactly what they're studying. So, I mean, there's research coming out. You'll see when you look at the uh, this recording on the dog and cat research, some of the, the dog and cat stuff is super recent. Like it's, there's some that's so recent that there's not a publication date. Like you'll see the, the, year and the month and the volume and the page numbers it doesn't have any of that it just has um advanced online publication it has not been printed yet so that that specific level 
there's probably some genius out there that knows it, but I certainly don't. Okay, so it's an exciting time. We're making history. Mm -hmm. Can you give a horse too much? Do we know? Pro uh, probably. Next yeah. question is, my horse ate the whole bucket or the other night. I had somebody say my dog ate the percent. I mean, these are things that we're going to have to mm -hmm. try to figure out who we're calling about this yeah. and finding out. Um, the I mean, first person I would call is your veterinarian and they'll give you advice like um, either, depending on what they ate too much of, because we get these calls all the time. We get a lot of dogs that like the UPS driver threw the supplements over the fence and the dog ate the whole thing. We get uh. a ton of those. Um, is call your vet and depending on what it is they have resources to look it up they'll say bring the animal in because we need to take action right now or this is a case where nothing that they ingested yeah was too high levels but it's probably not going to be a problem just observe for any changes so talk to your vet first and if they don't know they have resources to find out for you to help you and then let us know too if it was one of our products, so we can file an adverse event report. Accidental ingestion is one of the like boxes you check. And we send those into the National Animal Supplement Council and they track them. So when it, you know, when it came down to that, um, melamine was in the dog food because we have a better system than the FDA for adverse event reports. All of the, the supplement providers that are under the NASC that are members knew immediately that day it first came out which of our products had melamine in it. Okay. Good. Yeah, it's important to let, let people know so we can track it. Okay, and I'd say it's always just good advice. You know, you can't control the UPS man, but boy, you can lock your own feed room and make sure the dogs aren't there while you're scooping everything out. Mm -hmm. um, how well do we know? How well are the topicals absorbed into the bloodstream? So I guess the question of, you know, where is this actually working? Is it working topically or are we giving it topically? And then it's because it's actually absorbed. Um, there's only one paper out about topicals in horses, and I have to admit, I haven't read the whole thing. I need to do that. But in, in people, I do know the research is very favorable and they've, you know, they, they did explain the mechanism and I have to say, I can't, I don't remember well enough to competently describe it here, but I, I believe the mechanism is known and it, it, does it does it's effective and it is um, so it is, is absorbed systemically it's not just working right there i think probably. it must be probably when you said try it see if it makes a difference how so every all medications are different here right we know butte makes a difference in 24 hours mm -hmm. i always say with equiox for example it takes a little bit longer how long would you say somebody starts using the cbd before you think it has an effect is it days weeks month um, I'm from supplement land and we, we talk about things in like 30 days. Okay. However, there is a paper out of Colorado state where a horse came in with a, a really unusual rare skin condition and they had tried everything. And I think the people like, well, it was Colorado state, you know, and marijuana has been legal in that state for a long time. They, they grow a lot of hemp. And um, that's where the guy is that knows how to isolate it from blood. So if you're gonna have an issue and you want to give CBD, go to, C go to Colorado State. They gave a horse CBD 24 hours later, the condition, remember they had tried everything. Condition was 100% resolved. Now they gave a pretty high dose, but the horse was at the clinic where it could have round the clock observation. Um, that's not going to be the case for most people. So, I guess it would depend on what you're trying to change also. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, okay. Here's uh, a $6 million question. Okay, great. Is this product going to be good for PSSM shivers and head shakers? Oh. <laughs> those were all from one person, but those are all very problematic areas where we don't have treatment. Oh my God. I know. I, I, I think we should try it. I mean, Why not try it. Can I, can I tell you? That, and don't tell anybody. And it's not like you're recording it, right? Um, uh, yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> when I when I first first we first said, you know what, we're smart pack. We're gonna we're gonna we're gonna try this. 
I actually approached Stephanie Wahlberg at Michigan State to do the research because I wanted to see if PSSM and shivers were gonna be affected by this. I thought she can do one study that is a, a safety study and an efficacy and we'll have the answers to two questions. And she was game and then she ran it by legal and MSU and they said, no way, we're not touching this with 10 foot pole. Apparently Michigan state laws hadn't, they hadn't figured out where they were falling yet. This was probably two years ago. And so she had to write back and I could tell there were tears on the keyboard. She was like, okay, they won't let me do it. I can't do it. So eventually Michigan will figure things out and um, she'll be doing a muscle study. That'll be very soon. And then head shakers, uh, there's a couple of people, you know, John Madigan is one of the people that studies that at UC Davis. I can't wait for those, but, but while we're waiting, I say try it. Okay. Somebody's asking, um, she's got a mare that takes a magnesium product to help with nervousness. Can we use CBD in conjunction with a magnesium product? You know, the, uh, the product that we sell on our website, the, the BioBalance by MVP, which has 100 milligrams of CBD, has magnesium in it. And I don't know the level, but it's probably like, you know, 5,000 milligrams usual usual serving size, but we're coming out with a, a CBD with other magnesium and other calming ingredients in it. So sure. Yep. What would be, so you've talked about starting at a lower level, maybe what, and again, I know we don't have the absolute science on this, but you have some anecdotal stuff probably. So what is the maximum dose you would say to use? Well, why don't we start with minimum? So minimum was your do yours is one fifty and a yeah, but thousand but, pound animal. Right, but when we when we looked at what all is out there and what what researchers publish or not are giving, it begins at twenty five milligrams. Twenty five. Twenty five. Okay. So if if twenty five milligrams is all your thousand pound horse needs to feel better about whatever condition he's experiencing, hallelujah! Look at the money you're saving. You know. Um, I, the naked leaf that we, that we sell is 300 milligrams. The Colorado State University skin issue, they gave 250 milligrams twice a day for two days though. So we're talking about, a, a, that was a therapeutic use of, of CBD that almost prescribed, you know, and, but it was only for two days versus a lower dose over a long time. So I, I certainly wouldn't give that amount for weeks and weeks and months and months, but I, I, I say start low. And start low, go a few days or a week? Maybe two weeks. Two weeks, then move it on up. Or maybe maybe even a month. Yeah. It, it's up to you. You know, how soon you need your answer back? I mean, yep. it's like nine degrees here. I'm not really doing anything with my horse for a while. So I got time, but yeah. Okay. Um, Dr. Pell here at our practice, she does a lot of dentistry and she's been uh, doing some incisor instructions for EOTRH. Do you remember what that is? We weren't do doing much that? of that when you were oh. in clinical practice. Yeah, but. No, <laughs> no. Um, more and more, right? We're finding this problem and horses are living longer. And we, we think these horses, we're always very aware of horses having orthopedic pain, but boy, the more we know and the more of these incisors we remove and watch horses have a transformational change, then we know they were actually in some horrendous pain, right? Yeah. Do yeah. we have anybody thinking about studying this use of CBD for this oral pain problem? There's certainly other forms of dental pain, but this one's a big one, I'd say. Well, now I am. Um, I suspect no, but I'm going to reach out to some people and ask if they're interested because I, it actually had not occurred to me. What a wonderful use for CBD. Oh, we'd I love it if it was helpful for oh, these horses. Man. So yes, that'd be great. And I, if that you need, great. if you need folks, um, Sarah's doing a little bit of it, but we work with Dr. Okay. Early at Cornell. You know, there's definitely some dental specialists that would be. Yeah. And Cornell is familiar with with experimenting with CBD. So that would be a good, a good fit. Yeah, that's no, that's really, that's a good thought. I like that. Okay, I think I've covered the questions that have come in from the participants. Okay. 
and we're right on time. So that was great. I'm actually glad you left a lot of time for questions because I think that we've had a lot of good discussion after the presentation. I figured there'd be a lot. I just want to sort of give a overview and then hit me. <laughs> and um, a lot of, I, we are not going to share your PowerPoint itself because that's your property. We mm -hmm. will share the recording, but there are they are asking like for the links. And so if you had a one pager PDF full of links that you wanted to email to us, maybe, then I think we'd make a lot. I can of do that. Happy. I think we'd make a lot of people. I would happy love with to that. do that. Yep. OK. Yep. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Lots of thank yous in the thank you. chat here. i um, going to check one more time. OK, I think we got all of that. So I'm going to throw up a poll while I get my. Um, so relaunch polling, you think? Yeah. Yeah, that's fine. All right. Oh, no, we don't want that one. We want a different poll. <laughs> Say end polling. All right. Go to the top, the drop down. Up here. Yep. And choose the next one. All right. A little bit of audience participation here. <laughs> Ooh, look at them coming in. We'll give you about 15 more seconds. So stop at 30. <laughs> Who put I've lost count? <laughs> the color one is funny too. Yeah, mostly single horizontal. Well, that's okay. false because Ben put zero. Ben put zero? Under my name. So there you can see the results. I had a feeling most of most were one horse owners. I love the I lost count that we've got about 10% there. That's funny. All right. And we'll do one more poll. Just do the drop down or say end. Stop share results. Yeah. And then drop down again. Yeah. It's donkey getting it. No donkeys out there today. There's a donkey. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there we go. Oh, Bay is going to prevail. Still 177 people eligible. Oh, yeah, right. <laughs> So 72% of you answered and bay is the most predominant color, which is certainly not a surprise to those of us who see horses all the time. Fantastic. Okay. So um, throughout the day today, we've had a little over 200 people. So I've made my own conclusion about that. So a hundred people come for the coffee and donuts. And then the other 200 that generally come, come for the actual presentation. So now that's something we've been wanting to get a handle on. So <laughs> by going virtual this year, we've got a handle on that now. So let's um, say some thank you to our sponsors because this uh, this comes, you know, that we did reach out to sponsors to give us a little bit of support for this. And we're really happy that we got some support from the following. So Boringer Ingelheim provided Dr. Pribble's talk today, Pribble. <laughs> and SmartPak provided Dr. Gray for our lecture. And then corporate sponsors were Merck Animal Health, Zoetis, Covetris, Patterson Veterinary, Davis Trailer World, and Triple Crown Feed. And then businesses who provided us with gift certificates and door prizes that will be mailed out after the event are Aurora Pharmaceuticals, SmartPak, Neutrina, um, Sandy Plum's Beamer Vetline, D'Amico's Tack and Blanket, True Fit Saddle, Balanced Strides Equine Body Work, and um, Farm and Family Insurance, instead of providing a donation or a door prize for you, has instead made a donation to Lollipop and Begin Again Horse Rescue in the honor of all of, all of you who participate. So thank you all for being here today. We have a pretty quick cleanup since we don't have to take down any tables in the gym or anything. And I think we just have to close up a few laptops and we'll be on our way. And I hope you all enjoyed your morning with us. We're certainly glad we were able to do something for you this year. And we really hope by this time next year, we're all out of this mess and everyone stays healthy. The door prizes will be emailed on Monday, Monday Christy's telling me. Have a wonderful, wonderful day out there in the snow for those of you who are here in the Rochester area. And thanks for coming. <laughs>